SSW has a long history with uh, Troy. He was one of our clients uh, many, many years ago. He used to work at Pfizer. And uh, I always remember that uh, when I went out to see him, he was like a serious dude. You know, one of those clients that is a bit more hardcore and doesn't smile and stuff like that. <laughs> so we sent out the best developers we had here to do all this, you know, it was a website with integrations to all these different systems. And I knew these guys were awesome. They smashed through a lot. We'd turn up to kind of, it was kind of a sprint review, but it wasn't called that because it was so long ago. <laughs> and um, I'd say, how's it going, Troy? Are you happy? Like, after, I'd only ask him after he saw all the work that was done. Because, yeah, it was all right. Like, and I thought, <laughs> oh, maybe he didn't notice. So next sprint, a whole lot of stuff. You know, we called them releases back then. And I said, Troy, you know, how, how's it going? Are they going well? All right, and I remember thinking this guy is super hard to please. Like he doesn't even give credit where credit's due. You know, he should be gushing, should be happy. And um, then uh, later on, he he uh, started doing a blog, and I remember I would, you know, I'd see his blog post come up, and I'd, you know, copy it in. I'd send him a whole lot of corrections. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother to do it now. And uh, I asked him to come along to one of our fire boot camps. And he was a ju judge at the fire boot camp and it was really good and he, he pulled out this, uh, I think it was one of the first times he tried this uh, pineapple device and scared all the living crap out of everyone in there. And um, uh, then he was just down the road here in Neutral Bay and uh, I said to him, you should uh, come and do a talk at the user group. You know, your blog's really good, you got heaps of good material. And he goes, oh yeah, I could do that. And so. Uh, there he came along and did an awesome talk and um, then I let him uh, uh, drive my Tesla the first day I got my Tesla. I didn't know he was a car guy, you know, I just thought he was a computer dude. Well, he got in my Tesla and he was, I thought he was fairly impressed, but he drove it like a maniac. And, um, and then he got me into his car, I wasn't that familiar with it, it, was, it looked like a lawnmower, it was uh, some <laughs> Nissan Nissan thing, and he took me for a ride. Well, I got it on video, right? I was just gonna publish it one day. Uh, he drove it like a maniac around Sydney streets and scared the living daylights out of me, but we had a, we had a good time. And then I think, uh, I might have the, uh, the timing wrong, but he did this video, it was the funniest video, I think it must have got a million views, where an Indian scammer called him up and he recorded the call. And he played along with this Indian scammer. He might talk about it. But if you have not seen it and you want entertainment, who's seen that video? <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, a good percentage of you. That was a hilarious video. He had a lot of fun. And he, uh, he all introduced us to the way to waste other people's time and have some fun. And uh, then he went on to uh, record some of his talks on Pluralsight. And he became the, uh, one of the top Pluralsight authors there. I like to uh, take a bit of credit because I got him doing his first talks. Um, but yeah, he's gone on to Pluralsight and that's, uh, you know, he's really done, done Aussies proud. Puts a bit of Aussie lingo. Cannot, cannot uh, pronounce Azure. He calls it Azure or something weird. But um, we're, I still try to coach him every time I see him. And he's, uh, you, know, you know, a lot of people waste their money on fancy cars and different things. He bought like a $15,000 ski jet ski and has the time of his life on this jet ski. My kids just adore him as the jet ski guy and um, he's just uh, uh, gets a lot of value out of that jet ski because he's moved from Sydney to, to Gold Coast. Gold Coast or Surface? They're both. Both oh, yeah. or whatever. I thought one might have more prestige than another. Surface is in the Gold Coast. Right, okay, all right, okay. And um, then he went on to, uh, he's presented in front of the US uh, Congress. Pretty, pretty cool. He's done something way more important than that. He produced Have I Been Pawned? Pwned? Uh, and uh, basically, every time someone's customer table becomes uh, breached, he puts it in there. You go there, you put your email address, and you, 
you find out whether you've been uh, compromised. Who's, uh, who's used that service? Every single person. All right, that's pretty cool. And um, have we got any cool breaches coming up? Yep. Oh, we do. Okay. Oh, 109 figures tomorrow. Nine figures tomorrow. Yeah, I won't okay. say exactly how many. We'll see. Okay, all right, we'll cool. Uh, so anyway, uh, doing the Have I Been Porn site turned him into an Azure guru. And he did this session at NDC. He was a keynote of NDC. And uh, he did this session, How to Run Azure on a Coffee Cup Budget with you know, doing a hell of a lot of stuff. So uh, it was really good. So I think that makes him pretty qualified to speak <laughs> at our user group. And so I welcome you, Troy Hunt. <laughs> All right. oh. <coughs> Most epic intro ever. About half of it was right too, so you did, did very well. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> no, it's off to a good start. Okay, so I'm curious now. Who says Azure? Hands up. All right. Who says Azure and is American? Oh, see, there we go. For the people not seeing the audience, basically no one says Azure. All right, so it's like user groups are pretty casual, right? So this is meant to be sort of a, a, a mismatch of different things. And I, I thought what we do, because we've got a couple of hours and, and believe me, we're going to use it. I thought I'd sort of do like an intro, which would be the first half of one of the talks I'm doing at the moment, which I think is really good fun, but it's going to lead us into <coughs> lots of other things around the various acronyms. So I don't know if anyone, I've got to remember which acronyms I'm talking about here. Because I, I literally, when I put this to Adam, I said, oh, what we'll do is we'll just throw all of these acronyms in the talk title and we'll just do them all. And then hopefully for most people, there'll be a bunch of stuff they haven't heard of. Everyone knows HTTPS. We're also going to do HSTS, CAA, XSS, CSP, SRI, and WTF. Everyone know those? <laughs> Some, the last one. All right, so I tell you what, let's, let's start with this initial talk. And because it's a user group and because we've got, what, about 25, 30 people or something, it's very intimate, just ask questions or hurl abuse or do whatever you want to do as we go along. So anyway, I've been doing this talk around uh, everyone being pwned and I find it really interesting as I do these events more and more and particularly as I talk to media more and more, I find it really interesting to see what the, the masses out there think information security is because it, it is one of these things that we see in the press every day, right? There's always something. At the moment, it's all my health record, right? The government's you know, pushing this. The doomsday is like, oh, everyone's going to get owned, it's all going to be over. Let's have a look at, at what it is that people think happens in this industry. No way. I'm getting hacked. Any questions so far? <laughs> One at the front. How do they make the PC run that fast? Wow, it is a real question. How do they make the PC? I don't know. It's like special effects and CGI and stuff. Uh, people really like these. So here's another really short one. So Stephen's reaction, for those who didn't see it, is that the generally accepted reaction, which is just face palm. Now, in reality, we know that the process is a lot slower and a lot more cautious. We know that people take precautions such as gloves, hoodies, uh, masks and the light, turn the lights down. It's very, very important. And <laughs> the, the funny thing about this is that th this is like the coal face of security that people get exposed to. So, so the general masses out there are seeing stuff like this and they're going, holy shit, like there really are people out there with hoodies. You see, right? Like every single time there's a cyber thing in the news, it's like hoodies and dark pictures and things. So yeah, moving on, I, I want to sort of get into talking about how everyone is getting pwned in one way or another. And obviously you guys don't need an introduction to what this service is. Uh, it does keep growing at an alarming rate. I, I just mentioned before there's going to be, th there's one which has literally got Azure cranking away at the moment. If your Azure is running slow at the moment, it's because of me. <laughs> so, so there'll be uh, all of them. Uh, so, 
So there'll be a, a, a nine-figure uh, sum of data that goes in there tomorrow. The, the number, I, I snapped this a couple of weeks ago, so there's a couple of hundred million more in there. So tomorrow it's almost going to hit 5.4 billion, uh, which will be pretty crazy. So there's sort of a constant feed of data that goes into here. But, you know, I mentioned earlier on the, the press, very often the incidents that appear in here, I end up talking to media, etc., and they want to know about how this whole thing of data breaches and stuff actually works. And people are always very curious about the name as well. So I'll, I'll talk to the media and they'll go, well, look, what's this, what is this pwn thing? So I'm really curious, you know, what, what does the word mean? I haven't heard it before. And I, I try and explain it in, in different ways. And uh, one of the, I think, most impactful ways of explaining what it means to get pwned is to imagine you, you had a situation like this and uh, when... Uh, <laughs> When that happens, that is one of the things that we would refer to as being pwned. Uh, I, I, in fact, this is actually the first time I've done this talk in Australia. Normally I'm doing this talk overseas. So I explain to people that down in Australia, when you get pwned, it looks a lot more like this. <laughs> and everyone's like, holy shit, that really happens? This is crazy. Everything in Australia is trying to kill you. But also pwned. Now, if, if we look to InfoSec for a moment, pwned would also be if you're a French journalist doing an interview about how your Twitter account got pwned whilst your Twitter account credentials are pasted on the wall behind you, uh, <laughs> that would also be another instance of, of being pwned. And you know, all of these are sort of true incidents, well, this one anyway, and, and I, I think it's just sort of curious to, to look at often where we set the bar for security. So there's almost like these, these two sides to it at the moment, where on the one hand we're doing some awesome sophisticated stuff and there's some really, really smart companies out there doing really, really awesome stuff. And then on the other hand, we've got incidents like this. Who saw Combank in the news a couple of months ago? Well, when aren't they in the news? Very good point. Uh, Combank was in the news for something very special, which has admittedly made for good content. They were decommissioning a data centre and as part of the whole Royal Commission and everything, this eventually came to light because apparently you just can't hide stuff in banking anymore. So what's happening is they're decommissioning this data centre and they're like, okay, we have got to take customer data from the old one and destroy it. Uh, and what they did is they loaded all the data on a truck. We have some file footage of the truck here from Combank. <laughs> and they've got the data on the truck and the truck is driving to the secure destruction facility. Now apparently there's about 12 million customer records on this truck. And the idea is that because everything's been like electronically transferred to the new one, they've got to securely destroy it. Anyway, apparently they had too much data uh, on the back of the truck and eventually some of the data's actually fell off the back. And th like this, I was going to say this would be funny, but let's be honest, it is funny. Uh, this would be funny if it weren't kind of true. <laughs> so so in, in the press at the time, KPMG was quoted as saying, they retraced the route of the truck to determine where they could locate the drives along this route, but were unable to find any trace of them. So we like literally have data falling off the back of the truck. And it, like we're doing all this super sophisticated stuff, but it's like also we had too many tapes on the truck. <laughs> I just find that fascinating. And, you know, I mean, obviously this is a very special case, but if we look at the number of times it's like, databases backed up to publicly facing websites in the root of the site with directory browsing enabled. And that's it. And if it weren't for the fact this is being live streamed and recorded and there will be evidence, <laughs> I would show you some Google Docs where you can find this stuff so quickly. It is just absolutely unbelievable. Now, moving on, one of the things I, I thought we'd kind of chat about because I think this is a really fascinating thing at the moment uh, is passwords. And this shot just here is MIT in the 60s and it's a compatible time sharing system. And the reason why this is sort of a significant shot is that this is believed to be the first ever instance of a password on a computer. Now the, the interesting thing is, is that when we think back like 50 years to this shot, think about the environment in which you had passwords. So first of all, this is a room of computer, right? Like this is when computers took up the whole room. So it's a massive unit in here you've got to be physically present to use it. Like there's no remote access, it's not like websites. So you've got to be physically present. You've got to know what you're doing once you get in there too. So, so what we should be thinking about here is, is the breadth of threat actors. So who could actually possibly get into someone else's account? Got to have physical access, got to know how to use the system. And frankly, if I or probably anyone else in this room was in there, I don't think we'd really know where to start. 
Now the next thing is, is that when you create your password in this system, it can kind of be just about anything. It can be your dog's name, right? Because there's no Facebook. So you've not put your dog on Facebook. You've not had it breached from another system and you've reused it and now someone's going to get it and use it here. And, and the point here really is that this was a much simpler time where we could get away with a lot of things with passwords that we can't today. Interesting thing is that back then, the, the way we did authentication was to say, I, I need two strings. I need a username, which these days is normally your email address, and a password. And if I have these two strings, and if the two strings match the two strings stored in the system, job done, you log in. And now, 50 years later, how many systems are still the same, where the only thing you need is a username and a password? Now, as we progressed, we started to realize that there might be some problems with this. So we'll go forward a couple of decades. So now we're into the 80s, and this is a Prestel computer system. And this is a very early generation system that you could actually access remotely. So they had somewhere in the order of like 90,000 people end up using this system worldwide. Now there's a, a bit of a classic video here where they show how to use the Prestel system, and the guy shows how to log on. And we'll just see if you guys sort of notice anything here that stands out to you. The Prestel computer is now asking me to enter my own personal password, which I have now done. <laughs> In case you weren't watching, I'll, I'll do it like a zoom enhanced CSI slow mo. Let's have a look at the password. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. There we go. The old classic still works. You know, still today, the most popular passwords we see are just sequential numbers. It's, it's ridiculous. So the problem now, like when you go 20 years on from that MIT situation, is now you have tens of thousands of people around the world that can use the system. And now you have people with capabilities that can be remote. So suddenly your threat actors have gone from this tiny, tiny, tiny little slice of people to a much, much bigger surface. And then we keep going. So let's go another couple of decades, and particularly when we get into like the 2000s. What we started getting now is websites all over the world, and everyone's starting to use websites. And we, we started to say, well, like the Prestel thing, where people were using passwords like 1234, not so good. What we should do is have password complexity rules. Because if we have password complexity rules, and we say that you've got to have like a min length and a max sort of mix of characters and everything, that will make the passwords more complex and it will solve the problem. Now, I've got a good example here of what happens when you do that. Uh, this is Bob. Bob's in accounting, and Bob is trying to create a password on a website with password complexity rules. Now, he needs to have a password that has lowercase characters, uppercase characters, numbers, and non-alphanumeric characters. Also needs to be at least 10 characters long. He can't use one of the last three passwords that he's used before as well, and Bob's losing his freaking mind because now it's too hard to create a password on a system. So we, we've got this sort of odd situation where we've gone to this other extreme where we're making it painful. And you guys have probably all seen this, where you go online and you're trying to create an account and it needs this crazy set of complexity stuff. And then you might create a really good password and it goes, no, you can't do that, you've got a space. <laughs> What's wrong with spaces? The, the ones I love, if ever you see one that says, you can't create this password, it has the word select in it, like you know shit's going weird in there. So, a lot of this happens over and over and over again. Now, consequently, what this is causing us to do is to create bad passwords. I'll give you a good example. How do we feel about this one? What, but why is it bad? Because it meets the criteria. Let's, let's go through it. Uppercase, lowercase, number, non-alphanumeric character, also 15 characters long. This is a good password. It's a dictionary. Well, it's a substitution. That's a word that's not in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple substitution. Well, it's, yeah, but it's not just that. It's not just substitution. I took the spaces out. <laughs> They'll never work this out. So, so the thing is, we look at that and we go, no, this is a terrible password. Because we know as, as humans, when we look at this, we can see character substitution, we can see predictable patterns, we can see that this is just not going to be good, even though it meets the mathematical criteria. 
And, and this, to be honest, is a really good example of why things like password strength meters that are just based on mathematics are terrible. And, and they actually drive people towards bad habits. Because of what I do with Have I Been Pined, I see an extraordinarily large number of passwords. And the number of times you see passwords which are clearly designed to meet minimum complexity rules because they have an exclamation mark on the end. <laughs> you know, and you're going, honestly, like, did you really just help make that person's password better? Now, here's the next problem. So, let's imagine you go back to your places of work tomorrow and you create this password. Don't do it because I've shown it publicly now, but just <laughs> hypothetically. If you do that and your place of work says this is good because it meets the mathematical complexity of a password, what's going to happen in three months' time? Oh, so someone's jumping ahead. So what I think you meant to say was in three months' time, they're going to ask me to change it. And what you would do then is exactly what you said, which is you'd do something like that. Well, that's just burned that one for everyone, hasn't it? <laughs> now, we know this. We, we all know this happens because we all do it. And I know we all do it because I've seen your passwords, trust me. This is something that we do. And then another three months goes by and we just do it again. I used to do this. Like, I, I am happy to admit this. And the reason I and everyone else who is silently inside their heads nodding do this is because we as humans are working around the technology controls because they're getting in the way of us doing what we want to do. And there's another problem that we have in the industry where we've got to try and say, we want people to be secure, but it's actually got to be usable and it's got to be practically secure as well. Just, we've got to get past this thing of compliance officer has a checkbox. So long as we check the box, we're good. Like, let's look at what's actually happening when people do this. So we keep going forward another three months, another three months, and here's a good trick you can do in your head. If you take the number at the end of your password now, and I know you have one, and you divide it by four, that's how long you've been at the company. <laughs> it works. Think about it. So this is not good because this forces people into undesirable behaviours. Now, I think we're having a real sort of shift in the industry at the moment because what we're starting to do is recognise that humans don't always adhere to the algorithms. And we're sort of discovering that there are better ways to do things. And I'll give you a really good example of that. The NCSC in the UK, they're a government department that actually puts out a lot of intelligent stuff. I know, like everyone's just like, what? They really do. Like they create a lot of really awesome material. Very practical stuff for end users, very practical stuff for people building systems. One of the things that they've come out with recently is they said you should only ask users to change their password on indication of suspicion of compromise. In other words, unless you think someone's password's been owned, don't ask them to change it. Now, th th there's a few good reasons why they're saying this. And th the first good reason is what we just saw, which is that when you force people to do that, they're really not going to make it any stronger. It's just going to be a crap variation of what's probably already a crap password. The other thing is, have a think about like the, the workflow here. Hacker gets your password, what are they going to do? It's like, well, look, I'm busy, I've got to pick the kids up, I've got work to do, make dinner, I'll get to it in three months, or are they going to go and use it? They're going to go and use it. And the only sort of gap in the argument there is some people say, well, what if your password got exposed a long, 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 long time ago, and then you finally discovered it later, and then it got used? Well, the, some of the other stuff that the NCSC adds this, and incidentally, it's not just the NCSC, it's stuff like NIST in the US, which is an enormously influential standards body. They're saying, you've actually got to be a bit smarter these days when you do authentication. So we've got to stop saying, do you have the two strings in your head? We've got to look at other things. So a good example, who's ever logged into Facebook and it says, hey, uh, you're not normally logging in from this location. We'd just like you to confirm that you are who you are. So maybe we'll communicate via a back channel. We'll send you an email. You've probably seen systems where you might get an SMS. And as much as people say SMS authentication is broken, SMS authentication on top of something else is better than just that other thing without any SMS authentication. So they do talk about adding lots of other controls. And obviously these days we've got things uh, like two-factor as well. We've either got soft tokens, we've got hard tokens. We've got lots of other ways of doing auth that can start to move us away from these other undesirable human behaviours. The other problem is, is that 
when you force people to create these arbitrarily rotating passwords with funny complexity rules and things like that, they'll take other shortcuts with the way they go about memorizing the password. I'll give you a really good example. So earlier this year, remember there was that, uh, that uh, I don't know, there was a bomb alarm or invasion alarm, whatever, the thing that went off in Hawaii and everyone got the messages, right? So they, they went and interviewed this bloke afterwards. And this bloke is, uh, he's there in the emergency response center and he's talking about the way they manage their systems. He's sort of standing here in front of the computers and uh, th there's something quite alarming down on this one. They're still running Internet Explorer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and also the passwords are on a post-it note. Because this is what people do, right? And, and they do this because, again, it's, it's the humans trying to get over the technology constraints that we put in their place. So we've got to get a lot smarter about these things. Now, um, I wrote back in August last year this piece on a whole bunch of different things. We're going to talk about EV certs and stuff like that shortly. But the, the point that I really wanted to, uh, in fact, you know what, we're going to go, let's actually go to this one because we want to go back to the MIT guy. The point I really wanted to capture here is that one of the other pieces of guidance that NIST came out with is they spoke about uh, this bit here. And effectively this quote says, I'm going to zoom it a bit for people at the back there. Effectively the quote says, there are certain passwords you should not let people use no matter how good they are. For example, you really shouldn't let people use a password that is the name of your website or your company. The number of times I go to a data breach and I'm like, okay, I've got to verify whether this is right. And the data breach might be called, let's just say Cloud Pets, because there was one called Cloud Pets. Uh, and let's actually take an example, because I showed the data in here. Troy Hunt Cloud Pets. There we go. Anyone got a Cloud Pet? No? Good. Uh, so <laughs> this is a Cloud Pet. A Cloud Pet is a teddy bear with a listening device in it connected to the internet. Doesn't that sound cool? No, no. <laughs> It sounds ridiculous. So Cloud Pets, as part of uh, me verifying the data breach after it got leaked all over the internet because they put it in a MongoDB uh, database facing the world without a password. And incidentally, they, they, they <laughs> you shouldn't laugh, but they put it in this database facing the world. It got wiped and ransomed. I think it was in about January, would have been January last year. So wiped, ransomed. The ransom left a Bitcoin address in there, said pay us Bitcoin or you won't get your data back. Other people then came along and changed the Bitcoin address to their own, which <laughs> ad admittedly, I did laugh at just a little bit. Uh, was it there? I hope they had a good backup so they knew every person they had to give the point Well, they had a lot of backups after this, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I have a backup. These are some of their passwords. Now, th the reason this is here is these were, um, uh, incidentally, if you're allowing a password of QWE, you are really doing it wrong. <laughs> this is a place where we actually need complexity rules. So all of these password hashes you see here are actually bcrypt hashes. A and bcrypt is a pretty resilient hashing algorithm because you can define a work factor that makes it go slower to calculate. And bcrypt done right is going to be millions of times slower to crack than, say, MD5. The thing is, is that when you allow people to have a password like Cloud Pets, I can have like a one word password dictionary and go through and just keep trying that on each hash. And I'm going to find a bunch which inevitably match. And this is part of the verification. It's like, is this really Cloud Pets database? Are there lots of passwords called Cloud Pets? Yes. Now you would also think that someone trying to authenticate to this system and get into someone else's account, one of the most logical passwords to try would be Cloud Pets. Anyway, so they say, you know, don't do that. Uh, they also say, try not to use passwords obtained from previous breach corpuses. So th this, I think, is quite intelligent because they're saying, if there is a data breach and a password is leaked, given that we know people reuse their passwords across different places, we probably shouldn't let them use that password again. Now, they didn't actually give you the passwords because it's like a government body. They're not just going to go, yeah, here's a bunch of pwned passwords. Uh, but I'm not a government body, so I did it. Has anyone used pwned passwords before? Ooh, okay, so it's a, a very, very small subset of the Have I Been Pwned users. So here's the way this works. This has got uh, 517 million passwords in there that I have taken from data breaches. 
And what you do is you go and enter the password you want to check like this and you go submit and it comes back and it tells you how many times it's been seen. Now, this sounds... Yes, you had a question? Yeah, so if... Sorry. If someone is basically putting their password into this, then isn't that not exactly a good thing to do in the first place? You don't trust me. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the mechanics of how this works. So this is a good question. Now, actually, let me, let me caveat this. This is now up to version 3 of Pwn Passwords. When I did version 1, I used to have a big bit of bold text at the top. It said, do not enter your password that you are actively using into any other site, even this one. And you know what people did? There's all this press about it. And it was like literally on CNN. And there's reporters going, you just go to this website, enter your password. And, it was, and they're like literally... And, uh, so um, we knew that people didn't read instructions anyway, right? Oh. Yeah, well, they don't read instructions. So they were going to do it anyway. This, though, when I got to version 2, so version 2 went out in Feb, version 1 went out about August last year. Um, version 2 does something kind of tricky, and I'll show you what it does. If we go to the Dev Tools and we'll look at our Network tab, let's go and search for that again. Here's the request. That's it. So it's a GET request. The password that I searched for is password with a capital P and an at symbol, because the hackers don't know what that is yet. We, you know, we, this is live. Okay, yeah. Now, okay, now they know what it is. That, they know this. It's character substitution. So uh, capital P at symbol, and then I think I put a zero instead of an O. But the only thing that's actually getting sent is this. And what this is is it's the first five characters of a SHA-1 hash of the word password with a capital P and all the other bits. So it's it's taking a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of information, and then what happens is in the response we have all of this. And this is going to be probably almost 500 records worth of the remainders of the SHA-1 hash of all the passwords I've loaded in, followed by the number of times each one has been seen. So if I scroll down to the bottom now, we'll see, there you go, almost 500, 497. This is called a k-anonymity model. And the way k-anonymity works is it takes a very, very small amount of information which does not disclose the source value goes to the service, brings back a whole bunch of things that may match. You might be searching for a password that's not in there. May match, and then what you can do is you can say, well, if I take that, one of these, and I add it to the hash that I searched for, the prefix, does it match the one that was entered into the system? So what this means is that you can either go to this website and use it there, or you can plug into the API and send these tiny, tiny, tiny little bits of information and get the response back without actually disclosing the source password. And the cool thing is, it's super, super fast too. So if I add a couple of bits of rubbish there on the end of it, that was, that was a slow one. That was like 600 milliseconds. Uh, da, 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 da. That was a bit better. It's a few hundred milliseconds. Depends obviously on latency and things like this. It all gets cached at Cloudflare Edge nodes. There's about 10 million hits a day to this service because it's now been baked into a lot of other websites. So for example, if you play EVE Online, EVE Online integrates Pwn passwords so that when you log in, it's like, let's just check to see if your password has ever been exposed before. They can't take passwords in storage because they're hopefully bcrypting it or doing something like that. <coughs> but they can take the password you provide at login, hash it, get the first five characters, throw it here, bring this back, see if you're in the results set. And then if you are, they can go, you don't want to use this anymore because someone might try and take over your account. Does anyone have any questions about this? Yeah. Normally when I do that, Yeah, let's get a bit, bit of microphone, and then, and then I'm not quite sure I understood it either, so maybe ask it in a slightly different way. Slightly different way. Um, when they're generating hashes, uh, normally from a password, you'd throw in some... Oh, you mean like you'd salt it? Yeah, yeah. Right, so we, we've got to sort of separate what we're doing here. So the, the, sort of the, the premise of, of salting a password is if, if you're going to store it, you don't just want to have a direct hash of the input, otherwise every person who uses the same password is going to have the same hash. Yep. Uh, and then you'll see all the, the Cloud Pets people have all got the same <laughs> you know, hash. Uh, plus, if it gets indexed, either by, we used to use rainbow tables, which are like pre-computed hashes of plain text, or if Google indexes it, then you're going to have a problem. Uh, so this is sort of a, 
that your premise there is about how should we store passwords if we're running a, a system. The, the premise of Pwn Passwords is saying, look, we just want to get enough information that we don't know what your password actually is, but it's enough for us to give you a whole bunch of options. And if yours is one that's in there, then we can figure it out. But you can only do that when you have the plain text password at the source. So right. if you're running a system and you're like, I want to check all my users, but I'm bcrypting all the passwords, you would have to wait until they register, change password or log in, so that you had their password in the plane, and then you could hash it and grab that prefix. Yeah, my next question would be uh, who stores plain text passwords, but... Oh, mean, how long have we got? I would, I would only <laughs> store hashes, but... Man, I, <laughs> who stores plain text passwords? Oh, jeez. Have I been pwned? Who's been pwned? Plain, we'll put it this way, there's 59 results for plain. They do, 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 they do. They can do this all night. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's insane. Can we pass the mic back? Um, my question is, uh, some of these features like testing against these sort of facilities, if you're using a large provider like Azure B2C or something, how far away are these sort of techniques from being able to integrate into those product offerings? So services like Azure AD, I'm trying to, trying to think of the right way to put it, they do a lot more than just matching strings. So they certainly, they certainly have the capability to look at other heuristics and other behaviours about the user. They certainly have the ability to look at what would constitute a bad password just beyond the mathematics as well. Really depends on the provider too. <coughs> so there are services out there that have sprung up literally to sit between your customers and your authentication repository just to look at whether they're behaving like a normal person normally would, like that normal person really would, or whether there's someone else, whether they're using credentials that might have just been seen to be breached. It, like there's a huge amount of sophistication that now goes into authentication beyond just are we going to match the username and the password. So it could be in there already just sort of follow up with them sort of thing? There is a lot of stuff beyond matching strings. <laughs> like, let's, let's just say that. And, and, and for, for obvious reasons, the likes the likes of Microsoft don't talk too much about what it is because they don't want to give away the techniques they're using to try and stop stuff like account takeover. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, I'm sure you guys will have a lot more questions yet. So, um, right, going back to there, there's the poem passwords thing. You can also just download all this. So the 517 million odd records, literally down the bottom of the page here, there's download links. You can just pull the whole thing down if you want to run it off-site or, or rather out of the cloud because you don't trust me or whatever. Yes. <laughs> That uh, how do you get all these leaked databases? Because ah, good question. How do I get all the leaked databases? So when I first started Have I Been Pwned, this was late 2013, I had been doing a bunch of analysis of data breaches and I would go out and I'd find data myself. There, there are places <laughs> on the internet uh, still today where this sort of information gets traded a lot. And w when I say traded, not necessarily in a monetary sense. Very often it's just swapping data. So I, I went out and I found things like Gawker and Strat4 and Adobe, which was the big one in the initial load. These days, there's a lot of people that support Have I Been Pwned. And I would say, on average, probably once or twice a day, someone sends me data. And, and when I say sends me data, I mean that they can pop up and give me anything from sort of saying, hey, have you seen this paste on paste bin with 500 records, through to literally hundreds of millions uh, in some cases. And it's, it's people from a, a lot of different walks of life as well. So some of them are reputable, well-known, white hat security researchers who, who have data and, and they want to sort of do the right thing by people who've been impacted in these breaches, they want them to know. Sometimes it is people who are probably on the shadier end of the gray spectrum. Uh, I, I try not to ask too many questions of, of some of those people. But it's always people popping up going, here is data. I, I certainly never go looking for it anymore. All right, let's keep moving on this. So you can go and download that and use all of that however you like as well. Now, um, a couple of other things. We'll, we'll sort of do a couple more slides on, on something a bit tangential, and then we're going to jump into the acronyms that I mentioned earlier on. And one of the things I, I thought we'd touch on, because this always seems to become a topical issue, is uh, services like WhatsApp. Now, um, I snapped this off my wife's phone <laughs> with her permission. So she was using WhatsApp, this was last year, and she's communicating with, uh, with the other mothers in the mothers group about uh, sports carnival, because apparently us 
fathers are terrible at organizing this stuff. And they're using WhatsApp and it's all very nice and they're blowing kisses and stuff like this. And the, the, the thing that no one explicitly opted into but that everyone gets for free uh, is encryption. We know it's encryption because it's green. And um, everyone reads the news, don't they? Yes? Good. So, so the, one of the really neat things about uh, things like WhatsApp, things like iMessage as well, and a bunch of other communication platforms these days is end-to-end -end encryption, encryption by default. And this is a really good thing, the way it's done in platforms like this. Uh, now look, people will say, look, we've always had you know, PGP and things like this. Anyone set PGP up for their email lately? It's not much fun. Like, and I, like there's probably people watching this remotely and they're stroking their beard thinking how ridiculous that is because it's actually really easy. But from a consumer perspective, it, it's not an easy thing. So for platforms like this to do it without anyone asking is amazing. Now, you get the benefit in encryption whether you're talking about kids and sports carnivals or whether you're a terrorist. And the, the whole thing has no ethical bias. And, and this, of course, is leading to a whole bunch of problems. Uh, and one of those problems relates to people like this. Now, this slide makes a lot more sense when I do it in the UK. Does anyone here know who, who this is actually? So this is a lady called Amber Rudd. So she was the Home Secretary in the UK, not anymore. And she, like many people in government, were getting very worried about this end-to-end -end encryption stuff. And she very controversially said just recently that real people don't need encryption. Real people like my wife <laughs> don't need encryption. She actually said a lot of different things in that particular event. And uh, the, the thing is, is that what she is saying is echoing the same things that many other politicians and leaders are also saying. Now, I'll give you a really good example of this. Everyone knows who this guy is. And Turnbull was at a, a press conference last year talking about encryption and talking about the challenge of end-to-end -end encryption. And, and like, let's also recognise for a moment that for law enforcement, who despite what some people think, really do want to stop us from getting blown up and stop pedophiles and things like this, like they do actually have a kind of important role to play. This does make their job harder to get in the middle of digital communications. So Turnbull's got this press conference with the AFP and there was uh, someone in the audience who said, uh, look, you know, you, you're sort of heading towards this yeah, ban encryption sort of direction. Encryption is just mathematics. Like, how on earth do you intend to ban the laws of mathematics? And I, I want to play you this most epic of responses. Uh, laws of mathematics are, uh, are uh, very commendable, but the only law that applies in Australia is the law of Australia. Now, just in case you couldn't hear this, because that was a slightly uh, low clip, he says the laws of mathematics are commendable, but the only law that matters in Australia is the law of Australia. Now, because everyone has such a funny opinion of Australia, when I'm overseas, I talk about the laws of gravity and drop bears and things like this. And everyone thinks it's hilarious. But the, the fact remains that I don't even need to explain to you what's wrong with this, because everyone's looking at it going, holy, like, ugh. <laughs> Normally, <laughs> when, I, um, when I go overseas and I, before I play this bit, before I get to Turnbull, I'm like, you know, there's this world leader who's been saying some stupid things lately. And everyone gets really excited because they're like, oh, it's going to be like a massive Trump takedown. There will be Trump later. I'm not going to leave him out of it. Uh, this was our turn to shine, though. <laughs> now, let's, let's continue the encryption discussion because there's other interesting things happening on this front. Okay, now, a little pop quiz. Who knows what this is? It is a handbag. Congratulations. Now, there is some truth to this. Apparently, in usability studies done by Mozilla, an alarmingly large amount of people think this is a handbag. It's a what? Lock. What? No, it's a handbag. You, look, when you go to the shopping site, what do you need? Handbag. Okay, it's also secure. <laughs> so, I, I think I just confused uh, any number of people on that one. But, ooh, ooh, that was unusual. <laughs> wow. I'm not sure if that's really cool or really freaky. <laughs> All right, go away. Everyone's going to know that I'm username at domain.com. Is, is that Skype for business? 
Why does Skype do that? Okay, so anyway, the, the point with the, uh, with the handbag bit is apparently a lot of people do actually think there's a handbag. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing because, of course, what we normally associate this with is the secure text, and this is what we see in Chrome today. Now, we're going to start talking about HTTPS and different nuances around HTTPS. And the first thing that I thought I'd try and establish here is that this has become problematic in a pretty important way. And what I thought I'd do is I'd show you an ad that Barclays Bank was running last year, but they're now no longer allowed to run it. So I'll play the ad, have a think about what might be wrong with this. Supercon! Defender of the galaxy, complete with powerful disc cannon and realistic sounding jetpack! Defender of the... Oh, you know what? I can't do this. It's all rubbish. It's a scam. If you order me, you'll get nothing. Look, in there, you need a padlock when you pay for stuff. If there isn't one, the website could be fake. Oh, look at that. Defeat online fraudsters this Christmas. What do you reckon? So it can still be fake even if it's secure. And, and, and this is the problem, right? But in fairness, think back, like let's think back a decade. It's hard to think back a decade in tech, right? So, so think back to like just after we got the iPhone. That's how far we go back. And we would always give this message, look for the padlock, because if you have the padlock, you know it's secure. The padlock is this sort of independent verification by the browser at the site is secure. And at the time, to go and get HTTPS, you had to spend money to get a certificate. You had to do a lot of mucking around to make it work. It was the domain of banks and e-commerce sites, and even then, not consistently. A decade ago, Facebook didn't have HTTPS on their login page. Their authentication tokens weren't sent securely. Like, it was a very, very different world. But what's happened over time is that HTTPS has started to become ubiquitous. So now we have situations like this. Now, thinking back to the Barclays ad, would you trust this site? It's got a handbag. <laughs> must, must be good. So, so the, the problem is, of course, everyone here is looking at the bit of the URL that I've obfuscated. And already, if you're actually looking at the URL, you're doing something that most people don't do. And this is one of the problems we've got. Because people don't pay a whole lot of attention to this stuff. This is why phishing works so well. In a case like this, when the URL is deliberately constructed to use portions of what you would expect in the URL as well, it makes it even harder. One of the things you'll see a bit is you'll see phishing URLs. It'll be things like www.netflix.com.myphishingsite.com. And all you've got is like this massively big chained subdomain. OK, so this is a phishing site. This is what it looks like. So this is why the Barclays ad doesn't work anymore. The Barclays ad got pulled off air by the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK early this year. Isn't that interesting? You can't say that anymore. You can't say to people, look for the padlock. Now, a lot of this is because of these guys. Who's used Let's Encrypt before? Were they good? Did you get your money's worth? Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Because now, Let's Encrypt is free and automated and open. The first thing is very, very clear. You don't pay any money for it. The second thing is, is that when you get a Let's Encrypt certificate in environments that do a good job of supporting it, so for example, you run your own Linux box, or you're using a hosting provider that integrates. In fact, the hosting provider integrating is the open bit, because the APIs in which the way you request the certificate is all open. Anyone can integrate into it. But the automated bit is easy because now, rather than going like downloading the public key and the private key and then getting OpenSSL and compiling it into a PFX and up, just doing all this crap, you go there and you run a command and it's done. And because of this, we're getting this really, really broad adoption of HTTPS. Now, you and I probably look at this and go, well, this is good. Everyone's now getting encryption. We used to have to pay for this. How do you think companies charging money for certificates feel about this. Less, less good, less good. Now, I want to I try and, this, like, this is a controversial bit, but let's try and put into perspective how organizations are reacting to the likes of Let's Encrypt. I want to say organizations, we're largely talking about commercial CAs. So um, I wrote a blog post last year, particularly as Let's Encrypt and so on were gaining traction. This was, this was bang on a year ago, look at that, just under a, a week over a year ago. 
And uh, there was a, an interesting discussion in here led by this guy just here, Malai, whose last name I won't try and pronounce. And Malai was the CEO of Komodo at the time. Komodo was the world's largest issuing CA. They were massive. Today, it's Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt is huge now because <laughs> funny thing happens when you make stuff free, lots of people use it. Now, Malai was pointing out a particular phishing site and he was saying, look, um, you know, th this phishing site is, uh, says secure. It's misleading, isn't it? You know, do you see the secure logo on this phishing site? And the point that Malai is making is that because people have been trained to look for the padlock, when they see that, they're going to trust the site more, which makes phishing sites more effective once they have the padlock. So I embedded this tweet from him. I embedded another one down here. Looks different though. Does anyone know why this one looks different? This one's been deleted. This is what an embedded tweet that hasn't been deleted looks like. This is what one that has been deleted looks like. But when you embed a tweet using the little piece of source code that uh, Twitter gives you, they give you a block quote with the original text. Here's another secure one. Of course my data is secure with these fishes, aren't they? Why did the CEO of Komodo delete the tweet? This is the website, the one I just showed you. This is the issuer. <laughs> and as Eric Lawrence, some of you may know Eric or know of Eric. Eric created Fiddler. Many of you probably use Fiddler. We use Fiddler later on. He said, when you work at a CA and need a phishing site, to make a point, choose one for which a competitor supplied the certificate. So what's happening here is commercial CAs, and some of them in particular, particularly Komodo and particularly in Trust, are really, really struggling to sell certificates. And that's leading to some other interesting things that happen as a result. Now, I'm going to explain this by going here. Whose website is this? Apple. Why do you say it's Apple? What if I show what if I show you the tab? What if I show it to you in Chrome? Because that's not Apple. You think it's Apple, but it's not Apple. Because they're what these are are non-Latin characters which look like A's and P's. But it turns out there are characters in other languages. And you can use Punicode to go and register them and get yourself an internationalized domain name, which is the IDN that you see there on, on the tab. And it looks just like another name. The difference is, is that Chrome will render the escape characters for those codes. Firefox will render them as they appear in the native language. So, so this actually shows a problem. And, and, and the problem it's showing here is that just because we see a name that we recognize in the URL, doesn't mean that it's the site that we think we're on. Now that's if you even look for it in the first place, because we just established how people don't look for it. So let's, uh, let's do a little demo here. If we have a look at my site here, like that, handbag, secure, HTTPS, all green. This is a DV certificate, so domain validated certificate. The requirement for having a DV certificate is that you control the domain. That's it. The requirement for having a DV certificate is not you require the domain or you, you, you acquire, you own the domain and you're a nice person. There is no nice person requirement for a DV certificate. Again, like encryption being morally neutral, which is why we saw things like the Netflix phishing site. Now, what if we go here? This is different. Everyone know what we're looking at here? We're looking at a green cert would be one way of putting it. The more technically correct name is an extended validation cert. Uh, and an EV cert looks somewhat different. EV certs have a much higher bar to reach in order to acquire one in the first place. And that bar begins with you must have a legal registered entity. So I went and registered a business in Australia called Have I Been Pwned. So there is a Have I Been Pwned. The ABN which owns that is owned by me. So my name then appears after it, and I'm in Australia, so we get AU. When I got this cert, not only did I have to pay, I think about 400 bucks for two years, so the cert lasts for two years. I also had to have a phone call with uh, DigiCert, who I got the cert through. They wanted to have a, a Skype video call with me. I had to hold my passport up next to my face while they took a photo of me. 
This was after I had to do a whole bunch of business registration. I had to like jump through all these hurdles to get this cert. And again, remember, this is like the key bit. I had to pay 400 bucks for two years. But the thing is that when you go here now, you can be confident that there is a legal business entity that owns Have I Been Pwned. Now, commercial CAs love EV because you can still charge money for EV. And they make the point that if you have EV, people will come to your site and they will trust it more because they know it belongs to a legal business entity and they can see that business entity and they can see which country it belongs to. As a result, they will buy more of your things, more trustworthy, everyone's happy. Now, this is where things get interesting because here's the challenge. If commercial CAs are making the argument in favour of EV on the basis that people will trust it more, let's do a little bit of a quiz about which sites have EV and which ones don't. Let's start somewhere big. Uh, let's start with, say, Facebook. Who thinks Facebook has EV? Put your hand up if you think it's got EV. Okay, Ruby, put your hand up if it's got DV. None of this adds up. <laughs> like, you've got to pick one. It's a fair... <laughs> <laughs> like, there's no penalty if you get it wrong. <laughs> it's okay. All right. God knows what we'll have on my Facebook, but let's go there. Oh, it's always Scott, isn't it? He's very active, Scott. Okay, so... Uh, not EV. Now, I, I said not EV because it could be OV. It could be an organisational valid, organizational validation certificate. But whether it's OV or DV, it's the same visual indicator. So really what we're talking about here is does it have EV or not? It doesn't have EV. Uh, okay, let, let's try something in a very, very different class. So let's go shopping. So again, remembering that the premise is, is that you should see EV to create a sense of trustworthiness. So what about eBay? Who thinks eBay has EV? Okay, so we have a few more nods and hands. Who thinks it has DV? Not EV. Same thing. And if it wasn't, wouldn't that be weird? And we'll talk about that actually in a moment. But all right, so, so here's the premise. Like, this is the really key insightful bit. If you believe the commercial CAs and EV is required for authenticity and for trustworthiness, if you went to eBay and you only saw Secure and Padlock and you didn't see EV, would you leave? Because EV is predicated on the assumption that if someone doesn't see it, they're going to change their behaviour. CAs jump up and down and they say all the time, you should get EV and that will stop phishing because people will see that. The problem is, is that the phishing sites have DV. The phishing sites look just like this. And because people trust that, in part because we've conditioned them to the wrong thing for many, many legacy reasons, it just doesn't work. What about Twitter? Who thinks Twitter has EV? Oh, twist. Now, here's the interesting thing. Back here, when I did this post, down here somewhere, you'll see this. When I was having one of these very robust internet debates, I made the point that the world's top 10 largest websites all have DV. And you see Twitter down the bottom right has DV. And when I posted this, I had a bunch of people around the world going, no, it doesn't, it has EV. And they screen capped it and I saw EV. And then this guy in Norway was like, no, 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 it's got DV. And he screen capped it and it had DV. And what we realized is that depending on where you were in the world, you would get EV or DV. I travel around to all these places and believe me, I look for this shit and I had never noticed it. I had no idea. And if I don't know whether a website's meant to have EV or DV, do you think the normal person's going to change their behaviour in the absence of EV? No, they never will. So, let's, uh, let's keep beating it because I don't think it's quite dead yet. Uh, so we'll go a little bit further. All right, this, uh, this website has an EV cert. What does Stripe do? Are you sure? Nope. Because the, here's the problem. You all went payments because there is a company called Stripe that does payments. There is also a company called Stripe in another state in America which was set up to make the point that you can't trust the name in an EV cert. This was set up by a guy called Ian Carroll to demonstrate the deficiency that we have in EV, the expectation that just because we see a name that we recognize that we can trust it. 
It's not how it works. Another one. This site has an EV certificate. This site sells SSL certificates. They are very, very vocally in favour of SSL, SSL certificates. Incidentally, when we say SSL, we really mean TLS. We just keep saying SSL because we've always said it. You know what I mean. Now, uh, they have also been very vocal against Let's Encrypt. Not real happy with Let's Encrypt for reasons that you can all probably figure out. This is the SSLstore.com. There is a big logo that says the SSL store. So what's going to be the business name on the EV cert? <laughs> that would be good, wouldn't it? No, it's not. And when I see this, to me, it has the absolute opposite effect of creating confidence in the authenticity of the site. Because what I'm hearing is that you guys have just said, we're like the SSL store. Here, let us prove that we're actually this different organization. And that just, that just doesn't gel. All right, last couple of things, and I know Adam wants to do something as well, uh, and then we will do more stuff after this. So first of all, this is sort of the, the basic premise of what we're talking about here. When your security control relies on the absence of a positive visual indicator, it's just not going to work. And, and that's all EV is. It's assuming that when someone goes to a website, they notice something missing and they change their behavior. And that's a really problematic assumption. Because of this, I believe that we will see EV die. And there are a couple of really good supporting reasons for that. Here's the first one. This is Chrome with Komodo loaded up in it. I asked them to load Komodo for obvious reasons. Komodo normally has an EV cert. I snapped this on the Gold Coast about two months ago. I was running a workshop up there. I had three different machines in my workshop where Chrome was not showing EV. The reason why is that Google are actively testing, deprecating the visual indicator that is EV. Now remember this too, EV is only a visual indicator. No more crypto, there are no more bytes in the certificate or like any of the, there's nothing more in strength. It is just a visual indicator. So Chrome is saying, we think that maybe people don't actually pay much attention to it. Let's test that theory. So one of the things I've learned in recent times is that Chrome does a huge amount of user testing to see how people behave to little nuances like this. I met a lady in Hawaii a few months ago, I went to a conference there, a lady called Emily Schechter. She works on the Google Chrome team. She did a really awesome presentation about uh, the way people behave with visual indicators in browsers. And she was sort of showing a whole bunch of really interesting stuff around things like people are useless at looking at the URL. And they've got loads of evidence to support it. So they're testing removing it. I think it's going to disappear. Another reason is this. Bank of America has an EV cert, but you're not seeing it here. This is iOS 12 running Safari. So iOS 12 is what anyone with an iPhone or an iPad is going to be running come September. This has absolutely positively been <coughs> removed. And in fact, we had this confirmed. Someone here asked the question, can you confirm what's going to happen? This guy here who is on the, uh, on the Safari team has said, yep, this is the new behavior. And that also goes for Safari on Mojave as well. So if you're a Mac user and you're using Safari, the EV visual indicator is going to disappear. One thing you may have noticed, and this actually makes things even more confusing, this is green. DV is black. So think about all the like, crazy mixed messages we're giving people. It's like, look for the padlock to know it's secure. Oh, hang on. Yeah, no, 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 don't, don't do that anymore. Uh, look for EV and then you know it's a legit site. Oh, but Facebook and eBay and just about everything in the top 10 except for Twitter don't have it. And now it's like, look for the green because if the URL is green, even though you can't see it. <laughs> These are just client visual indicators. That's all they are. And there is no unified standard. So uh, I, I think what we might do now is, is just sort of like pivot onto much more random stuff. Uh, around the, the various acronyms. And what I thought we'd start with is, um, this is going to be a bit ad hoc because I haven't tested these sites first, so it might be interesting. But um, let's just do Adam's site. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you know what? I was going to do the SSW site. Let's see if it works again now. SSW.com.au. That was dead like two hours ago when I tested it. Just saying. Browser's on it, don't worry. Okay, so let's, let's go to Adam's site. Now, here's the, a couple of interesting things. Uh, in fact, what we might do, let's even just go to an insecure site first. So I have an insecure site, deliberately insecure, 
And let me qualify the term because some people get very upset about the nomenclature. An insecure connection site. The, the bit that people get a bit upset about is they see secure and they go, this is misleading because there could be SQL injection on the site. So <laughs> Maybe there could be, but that's not what it means. And just to be really, really clear about it, when you do see the secure text and you click on it, it literally says it's the connection that is secure. Conversely, when we go to a site which is not secure, such as the Hack Yourself First site, and it says not secure, it literally says it's the connection that's not secure. Now, hopefully some of you picked up what is brand new in Chrome today, which is that as of today, Chrome 68, every single website served over a non-secure connection says not secure. This is really significant. So every single website that we have, such as bomb.gov.au, served insecurely, will now tell people it's not secure. This is not a good look that you want. Now, I was chatting to a couple of people before, so some of you I know have seen these discussions, but there is, there's a charitable way of putting this, a school of thought out there from some people that, this is Google trying to take over the world. I've actually seen, some people especially listening to this will know who I mean, but I have seen people say, this is Google's Stalinist propaganda and it's a massive book burning exercise. True quotes. I'm going to avoid going a rabbit hole right now. Some people think it's Google trying to kill the web. What's actually happening here is we've seen Google, Mozilla, and also Apple by virtue of Safari constantly changing visual indicators to increasingly warn when there's a lack of encryption. There are many, many good reasons why we want to have HTTPS on a site like this. We're not going to go through the whole video now, but for someone who hasn't seen it and they're wondering why do I want HTTPS on, say, a static website, there's a blog post called Here's why your static website needs HTTPS. And I've got a video in here that I created that goes through and shows you precisely why. So this takes a static site and it does everything from injecting crypto miners to injecting a phishing page to serving malware to putting Clippy on it. You don't want Clippy on your static website. I'm just saying, right? <laughs> this is not the experience that you want to give your users. So this is significant to come from Chrome today. Now, here's the interesting thing when we do have a look at a site like this. If I type in bomb.gov.au, is it going to be an HTTPS request or an HTTP request? Let's try it. What we'll do, we'll even try Adam's, okay? So we'll go to Adam's site and we'll go to, we'll open up the network request. Let's explicitly go to HTTP. That first request, was it secure or not secure? Not secure. Not secure. Drill down on it. Headers. Okay. HTTP. Now, that request went through, well, it would normally go through to the server. This one's come back from cache. Incidentally, this is one of the reasons you want 301, because 301 gets cached. I was having a discussion with someone last night because I, uh, I launched a new site with uh, Scott Helm. I know some of you know Scott. We launched this new site called Why No HTTPS. So this was for the launch of Chrome 68, and this is a list of all the top sites around the world that don't do HTTPS by default. And if you're interested in Australia, and we go down to just there, BOM was one of them. Our top site in Australia that doesn't do HTTPS is the ABC. So if you go to abc.net.au, not secure. And in case you're wondering, like, is this, what's that? <laughs> In case you're wondering if this is like normal, a heap of media sites, even just this year, have gone HTTPS. So for example, CNN went HTTPS this year, bbc.co.uk.com still hasn't done it, went HTTPS. Last year, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, just about everything of significance has gone HTTPS. So getting back to Adam, we send a 301 back from the server. So first request goes in securely. Server responds, sends a 301. The 301 includes a location header which says, hey, go and do this. And then after this one happens, the second request here is now HTTPS. So now connection secure. What's the problem with this? Initial request can be man in the middle. So re remember what we're doing here. And, and, and this is sort of one of the, one of the, the interesting litmus tests for people. We're conscious that someone could be between this machine here and his website. 
So it could be the Wi-Fi here, it could be the ISP, it could be someone at a government level, at a tier one ISP level. It could be someone's hijacked DNS and they're routing it to someone else. I'm going out through your DNS provider here at the moment, whatever you've got configured on your router, you could be routing it to a malicious DNS server. Like HTTPS gives us assurance of all these things. We wouldn't go and use, say, a banking website without seeing HTTPS. Like, all of us would just go, I think all of us here would notice that we go, hang on, this is a bit unusual, but that's not there. Because we're conscious that there is this risk of someone getting in the middle of your traffic. So, if that exists, if there is this MITM risk, someone could get that first request. So, we have ways of mitigating this. Now, let's, um, let's just pick an Aussie bank and we'll see what they're doing. Anyone want to pick a bank? You answered NAV really, really quickly. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's see what NAB does. Now, NAB has got an EV cert. EV certs very often appear on financial services. Uh, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure why that is. I think there are a lot of legacy reasons. Having said that, I did go to a bank in another part of the world recently, and they have an EV, and they said, look, we are actually seriously considering removing it. And the reason is, is we have a need to go and get another certificate quickly. So let's say we've had like a key compromise. We need to go and get another certificate. The additional burden on getting an EV poses a risk. So we may actually not do that. We, we may roll back to DV. Now, of course, they could just roll back to DV once they actually have a key compromise, but it's not really a decision you want to make in a duress. Now, I just typed in nab.com.au and I ended up on the secure site. Let's have a look if they're doing the same thing as Adam or if they're doing something different. So we'll go to HTTP again. They're doing the same thing as Adam. Ooh. Naughty. Another bank. <laughs> ANZ. Occam.com.au. Actually, that just went, oh, oh. That is not what you want to see on a bank. Can I just propose? And I feel like I need to somehow screen cap this for the memory, like the fact that this is the first bank I've seen that explicitly says not secure. I suspect if we go back to the home page, it might be a different experience. But that, that is worrying. Now we're here. Oh, boy. Was it dot com? Is that okay? <laughs> okay, it's, ju it's just the Americans, don't worry about it. Dot <laughs> com's the American domain, isn't it? Tia do? Let's not get into that discussion. Uh, all right, let's go and take out the S. See what happens. Wow, they're doing it too. Is there anyone, is there any bank doing a 307? Combank. What about Combank? Uh, yeah, because that, that's ultimately where we're hitting. Combank.com.au? Is that it? Um, okay, let's clear that network traffic. <laughs> because I'm making it hard. All right, we found a 307. All right, has anyone seen a 307 before? Okay, 307 is an internal redirect. And you'll notice that the 307 had zero bytes in the response and it happened in two milliseconds. And the reason it happens, the non-authoritative reason, is HSTS, which brings us to our second acronym of the night after HTTPS. Has anyone used HSTS before? All right, a couple of people. So for everyone else, it's going to be new. HSTS is Hypertext Transport Security... What's HTTP stand for? Hypertext Transport Protocol. Strict Transport Security. HTTP strict transport security. And what strict transport security does is it allows you to return a response header over a secure connection, which will be the second one just here. And that response header, now if it's cached, it may not come up. So we're going to try and give this another good kick in the guts here. See if we can make it come up. Okay, <laughs> there, come bank. Oh, here we go. All right, it does this. Max age is like that. Now, what this says is for this many seconds from now, and I recognize that as being about one year's worth of seconds. So for this many seconds from now, you cannot make an insecure request. Every time I go back to this website, if I try and go over HTTP, I'll get a 307 internal redirect. It won't go over the network. It'll instead just reply immediately from the browser and go, no, 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 we've got to go secure. And then it will make a secure connection. How do you feel about that? Is it a good thing? Is, but is there, is there a remaining risk? Yeah, the very yes. first 
very first request. Okay, so now we have a different challenge, and this challenge is called Trust on First Use, which is also abbreviated to Tofu. And the Tofu challenge is that you must get one good connection in the first place. So you've got to be able to trust that you can get through any intermediary, because if there's an intermediary, they just strip the header out, right? You want to make sure, or, or they wouldn't even strip the header out, because the header has to come back over HTTPS for it to stick. They'd just get in the middle of the HTTP request, and then they'd have their way with your browser. So HSTS has this problem. But there's another way, and I can see that they're actually doing this already. In fact, this will be interesting. We'll see what's happening here. They have this keyword, include subdomains. That does what it sounds like it does. All right? It applies it to everything.combank.com.au. And then they've got this one. This is a magic one, preload. What you can do is you can take, we'll just take the domain there. You go to HSTS, htspreload.org. This site is run by the Chromium project. You plug in a domain like that and you say check eligibility. Now this is an interesting situation. I'm going to have to explain what's going on here because there's a very odd nuance here. What I'm going to do just to sort of show you what it would normally do is have I been pwned.com. Whoa. There we go. Have I been pwned is currently preloaded. What this site does is it allows you to take a site that is correctly configured. We'll come back and talk about the Combank thing in a moment. Plug in the domain. It will go to the site. It will make an HTTPS request and it will say, is there a valid cert? Does it 301 any HTTP request? Uh, does the STS header have a max age of at least one year and include subdomains and have the preload directive? And if it meets all of these criteria, and incidentally, they are all documented just down here a little bit, if anyone's wondering. If it meets all of those criteria, Chrome, Chromium will store this list and then every major browser draws from that list and it bakes it into the binaries of the site. This is really cool because what it means is, is that you can have what they call a static pin. So if I go to Chrome, Net Internals, HSTS, and I go down and I query, have I been pwned, it will come back and say this is actually statically pinned into Chrome. Now the cool thing is, is that if you have never, ever, ever, ever been to Have I Been Pwned before, but you have a browser that was released anywhere within the last few years, you've already got Have I Been Pwned.com in your browser. You can't make an insecure request. And this is like free and easy. You just return the header, you meet those criteria, you preload it, job done. Yes? Have you used or um, know of HTTPS everywhere? Do I know of HTTPS everywhere? Yes. So, so this is what's going to try and force all your requests to be HTTPS, even if the site wants to do HTTP. So it, won't get, it won't get the 301? Yeah, well, if it's in the, if it's in the list. So, yeah, well, this is the thing. Um, so this is the one made by EFF, right? Yeah, so uh, EFF, Electronic Freedom Foundation, uh, creates HTTPS everywhere, which is a browser plugin which tries to force all your connections to be HTTPS if the site supports it, which is kind of the key thing. If the site has HSTS and preload, it kind of fixes that anyway. And, and the problem, of course, is that you've got this tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the world that actually run this arbitrary plugin which they can go and download and use, whereas this, if you're a site owner, just fixes everything. So. This is really cool. Now let's have a look at Combank because this was a little bit interesting. And I think the problem here is it's gone and scanned it and said there's no HSTS header. But we just looked at it and we said, well, actually, yes, there is an HSTS header. So what's it doing? Mm. There, there are multiple problems here. Um, so this is, first of all, it's obviously not immediately redirecting. One of, the, one of the things, and this has become really, really apparent to me over the last few days, is that when Scott and I stood up this site, Scott has this crawler where he's crawling the Alexa Top 1 million every night. Uh, and in fact, the reason we made this site is, is it was only about a week ago, and I was saying, hey, mate, you've got all of this data. Why don't we put it on a website? Because I think it'll be interesting. And then in the last 24 hours, it's had like 100,000 people <laughs> visit the site. So evidently, it is actually interesting. Um, but one of the things that we learned when we're looking at all the stats is there's some really, really screwy stuff that goes on in terms of the devices that sit in front of websites and what they modify in requests. And a good example of that is in the, uh, in the blog post I wrote just yesterday to launch this, there's this Bangladeshi website. 
I don't know if you guys go to this website very much, um, teachers.gov.bd. So this shows up in his stats um, as not supporting HTTPS. But then you'll see when we scroll down a little bit, sometimes it does. But what was happening is it was some really odd stuff, like if you went to the host name without www, it didn't do HTTPS. If you went to it with www, it did. And then it got really weird, and I screen capped our chat here because he did an OMG, FWT, or OMF, you know, the things. It was, we we're losing our minds because he's like, if, if he changes the version of curl that is sent in the user agent request header, he would get a different response. Sometimes he'd get a 301 to HTTPS, sometimes he'd get a 200. Now, when sites get all the way down to that, like, I, I, I just don't know what it is, which is, I don't think it's a conscious decision, you know? It's not like, well, if you're using, you know, curl 7.55.1, you get HTTPS, but if it's 7.55.2, then you only get HTTP. Like, that's, <laughs> this is not a conscious decision, right? It's one of these screwy things. So the, the ComBank one I find interesting. Of course, what we could do is we could just go back to those Chrome internals as well, right? Those um, net internals. Uh, net internals, HSTS, and we can see if I have a static pin for it. I will have a dynamic pin because I just went there. Huh. Maybe it was under www. All right, so this is interesting. So you can see I've got a, uh, a dynamic pin just here. I don't have a static pin which means that at the moment, it's not baked into Chrome 68, which was literally the browser that shipped today. I wonder if I did www back here, but you should just be able to do the host name, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, so maybe it didn't follow all redirects. No, see, so it's a subdomain. You've got to do the, do, the, um, do the host name. Unnecessary HSTS header over HTTP. So this is saying it's unnecessary because the browser will not honor an HSTS header returned over HTTP. Because how do you, so here's an interesting thing. Like imagine you were a bad dude and the browser did honor an HSTS header returned over HTTP. You would go and man in the middle of a website that didn't do HTTPS, you'd add that header and you'd effectively deny the service to the person from being able to look at it again because it couldn't talk over HTTPS. Which would be amusing, but it wouldn't do a lot else for you. Now, uh, any questions so far on the HSTS side of things? Microphone. Hi. Um, I was just going to say one of the operational implications of HSTS is your cert handling has got to be spot on because if you mess it up, you're off the air. So if if you screw up your HTTPS, your site won't work. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, which is fair, the intent, you know? <laughs> but from a business point of view, the, the impact of that is quite large. Yep. And so it forces you to be operationally good in that area. So l let's talk about that because I, I think it's a fair point. And, and one of the biggest risks here is include subdomains. Because imagine you do have a really big brand and you might be responsible for running that, that root website. So let's say it's ComBank, right? You're responsible for running combank.com.au and you go, yeah, it's fine. We do everything over HTTPS. Let's put an HSTS header in there. And you've got the marketing department somewhere who does what marketing departments do and they just spin up random shit all over the place. And they've got a subdomain bound to a website somewhere that can't do HTTPS. You've just killed their site. You've killed your site for anyone that's been to the root site and has got the dynamic uh, implementation of STS and then you've killed it for everyone if you preload it and it goes out to everyone. Mitigating factors are if it was me and it was a massive brand like that and I was worried about it I would start by using HSTS with a low max age. Like set it for, let's set it to a day and then the worst that can happen is someone is going to not be able to access this other site that you would never even thought of on a subdomain for some period less than a day. Not too bad. And then you can start edging it out. In fact, to be really, really cautious, I wouldn't even include subdomains to begin with. I'd just do it on your own domain and then go beyond there. In fact, I'll show you, there's another really, really cool trick you can do here. Um, actually, let me finish with, with Adam for a moment because I want to make sure Adam's going to add HSTS with preload. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man, how much convincing does it take? All right, so, um, so that's really good. Let's get to the point here now, which is around uh, 
you might break other things. A good example of what you might break is what if you've got things like, what if you've got references through to other content on the site which can only be served over HTTP? Maybe some odd distributed web farm, some stuff you do over HTTP, other stuff gets routed to somewhere else. I've got a little um, test project here at reportyourdemos.azurewebsites.net. And this does something kind of cool. And in fact, to explain the way this works, I'm going to show you something else first, which is uh, bad SSL. Now, if you've never used badssl.com before, it's really, really cool because it shows you all the different ways that the browser will behave under different circumstances when you screw up your SSL, by which we mean TLS. We've had this discussion. So, for example, mixed content. Let's go down to mixed. All right, can everyone see what the problem here is? <laughs> it's, it's very bright, a fair comment. Uh, there, there is a security problem here. Ah, but it doesn't say not secure. Isn't that interesting? Why doesn't it say, well, why doesn't it say secure? Okay. DevTools, console. The page was loaded over HTTPS but requested an insecure image. And what will happen is that if we actually take a look at this image, we can see that this image is embedded over HTTP. This is what your site was saying. Remember we were sitting at the airport that time, we are going, hey, look at this, you've lost your padlock and your green and your secure and everything, because this is all it takes. It's like one image embedded insecurely. Now let's have a look at this. We'll go here. All right. Whoa, zoom much? Let's go out a little bit there. Now, everyone agrees this is the correct visual indicators, yes? Good. Let's have a look at how this image is embedded. Yeah. Tricky. So this, from an HTML perspective, is precisely what we just saw on badssl.com, but no visual warnings. Does anyone know how to do this? Ah, this, this, I reckon, this is like the most awesome ever magic trick for fixing HTTPS. And it's one that a heap of people have never heard of before. And when they, when they learn this one neat trick, they suddenly realize that HTTPS is not actually that hard. And here's how it works. Network tab, we'll reload this page. Here's the request. Here's the response headers. Here's my content security policy. So this is a CSP, which is another acronym we're going to get to in a moment. And what the CSP here does is it just has this one directive which says upgrade and secure request. And what that means is that every single other request that cascades down beneath that page, even if you explicitly say HTTP, will be upgraded to HTTPS. And therefore you get to keep your padlock. Now this is awesome because you'll, you'll hear people sort of say, well look, we've got this problem which is we've got some massive freaking marketing site somewhere and there's a CMS and the marketing department runs it and they can inject their own images and their own tags and everything. Incidentally, like that's starting to sound really worrying, but it's really common. And we don't know how many of them are going to be over HTTP. It's a freaking nightmare to fix. Whack this in, problem solved. The caveat, of course, is that the request that you're upgrading, so if you've got an, an image embedded from another domain, and this applies to every single domain as well. It doesn't matter if you've embedded stuff from all over the world. That service, which is serving the image, has got to be able to do HTTPS. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. One of the cool things about this is that even if you have a page with an iframe with JavaScript inside it that writes an image, which is then inside another iframe, and they're all in different domains, this cascades all the way down. So I actually had a problem with Discuss on my blog a couple of years ago. And uh, you embed Discuss by script tag. That's it. Script tag, HTTPS reference. And then they have all of this stuff downstream that, that they embed in your site. They made one mistake, which was probably just missing one letter from the scheme. You can guess which letter it was. And I started getting a warning on my site. I put an upgrade in secure request content security policy on there, immediately cascaded down, fixed everything, job done. Now, that's the first bit. We'll go to the next bit, because the next bit's really cool, and it addresses the bit about you might have other things on your network requested insecurely, how are you going to figure out what they are? 
Uh, let's go down to this one. Now, similar sort of deal. We have our positive visual indicator here, secure, padlock, everyone's happy there. Uh, we also have this image still embedded over HTTP. We know how this works. And we've got a JavaScript file embedded over HTTP as well. So we've actually got both passive and active content here. An image is passive because it doesn't do anything. JavaScript is active because it can actually run stuff. Incidentally, have a think about what you can do if you can run JavaScript on someone else's browser. Heap of fun. Anyway, so <laughs> there's something else that's going on here, though, and I want to show you what it is. Go to the Network tab, look at this request. Here's the first bit. We know what this is now. We know how it works. Here's the next bit. This is the cool one. This is a content security policy report only. Now, what report only does is it allows you to define a policy. And then if the policy is violated, not actually block, but send a report to a URI of your choosing. So let's have a look at what this means. My policy says default source HTTP. And what this means is, is that this browser is only going to allow requests over the HTTP, sorry, HTTPS, only going to allow requests over the HTTPS scheme. If there's a request over HTTP, it violates the policy. It won't block it because I'm in report only mode. If I didn't have report only mode and I tried to embed something over HTTP, it would be blocked outright. Then I have this report URI directive. And what report URI does is it allows you to declare another endpoint where if there is a violation in the browser of the content security policy, it will send a report to that address. This is the reporting endpoint that I'm using. Now, the reporting endpoint I'm using is on a domain called report-uri.com. And this is a project that Scott Helm and I run. And what this project does is it allows anyone to send violation reports to our service, and then we aggregate them and we do cool graphs and stuff like that. Let's actually have a look at the mechanics of this, though, because what's happened here is we've had two violations of the content security policy. One is the image, one is the JavaScript. Because I've got a report URI, each of those violations should be reported. And when we look over to the left of the screen, we can see two requests to report only. So let's have a look at what's in a CSP violation report. So here's the first one, and you'll see that it's a post request. So we're going to have a request body here. Down to the bottom, open up the report. This is what has just been sent off to the report URI address. It's a bunch of stuff here, but the important stuff is it says, well, look, First of all, here's the blocked URI. So here's the thing that violated the policy. It was an HTTP request for the image. Here's the document URI. So the document URI is the page which the violation occurred on. And that's just the address that you'd see in the address bar at the moment. It's violated the image source directive. So this is a, a content type of type image. This is what's violated the policy. And then there's the entire original policy here as well, which helps you with your debugging and the referrer and a couple of other things like that. Here's the second report. And this one is going to be for the JavaScript. And it says, hey, you tried to embed this JavaScript file of Cloudflare CDN. You violated the script source directive. Here's the document URI. So now, if you receive these two reports, you now have enough information to figure out where on your website you're trying to embed stuff insecurely. Not only that, but the request has actually been upgraded for everyone that went to that site, and it would have still requested it over HTTPS, but you get to find out about it as well. So you can actually go and fix it in the, in the source code too. Anyone have any questions about that? Because this is normally stuff like people have never seen before. But it's cool, because in the browser it's free. Any reason to fix it when it's already been fixed any reason to fix it when it's already been fixed by policy? <laughs> yep. Now, the good news is, incidentally, by show of hands, who here uses Internet Explorer and is willing to admit it? Yes. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Let the record show. Oh, no. um, when we look at can I use, and we look at uh, upgrade and secure requests. It's good news. Now, what you can't see here is Edge didn't get support till 17. In fact, Edge only got support a couple of months ago. 
So w one of the reasons you want to fix it is browser support. So if Internet Explorer is still important to you, or if older versions of Edge are still important to you, you want that. Firefox, Chrome supported it for eons. So you're OK on that front. Frankly, as well, it just I just like it to be right. <laughs> you know, like I, I want to fix my references. Any other questions about that bit? Because this is all like part of the, the ecosystem of having like a robust HTTPS implementation. Yeah. So generally, from what I understand, an app also works in a similar manner, right? An app also works in a application on your phone. So if you're using an app, and would it verify any of this, or would it completely skip it? Well, I mean, this is a browser security header. Okay. So this is something that the client, being your browser, recognizes. I mean, you, you could build an app that would do this. But if you're building an app, then you're probably embedding all the references into it anyway. And you'd just do it right in the first place. OK. Cool. Yeah, so, so this is really something for web pages. Other questions so far? OK, so I'm going to check how we're going on our, our acronym progress. So we've done uh, HTTPS, HSTS. Who's done CAA? One CAA. CAA is really cool. And, and here's how it works. One of the things that we're worried about, and I, let, let's actually spell it out. CAA is Certificate Authority Authorization. So one of the things we're worried about is what happens if someone else manages to get a cert for your website? Because then if they can man in the middle of your traffic and they can get a cert for your website, it's going to be a problem. Because now it's like they can put the padlock on the screen and they can intercept traffic and it looks really good for everyone else. So in, in fact, we'll talk about a couple of controls here. So, so CAA is the ability for you to whitelist at the DNS level the certificate authorities that you will allow to issue certificates. And in fact, we can see this. If I go off to uh, come back to IE, I'm going to need that. There's a good um, CAA record validator here. If we look at like troyhunt.com, what it will tell us <laughs> <laughs> not a lot, not a lot. If that doesn't work, we'll just do a who is or something. Um, try and, um, there we go, that's better. What it's going to tell us here is that, and again, this is at the DNS level, it's a record of type CIA. It's going to say, hey, for troyhunt.com, you can have certificates issued from Komodo. The only reason they're there is Cloudflare issues certificates from Komodo. Also from DigiCert and also from GlobalSign. And all of them can issue wildcard certificates as well. If anyone tries to get a certificate from a CA that's not in this list, the CA will not allow it to happen because all CAs are bound to check the CAA records before they issue a certificate. So what we've just done is, is we've narrowed down the field from hundreds of possible CAs around the world. And some of them in the past haven't always had the best of practices. That's why DigiNodar doesn't exist anymore, why Wysign doesn't exist, why Startcom doesn't exist, and why Symantec had to sell their SSL business. So you want to try and kind of lock this down. And the cool thing about this with the CAA records is not only will it restrict the CAs that can issue certificates to those three, if anyone else tries to issue one, I get an email because I've got an IO def here. It's just DNS records. And the cool thing is, if you completely stuff this up, like if you break it fundamentally, the way you fix it is you change your DNS record. <laughs> like it's, it's a very, very low friction, low impact change. So CAA is really neat. Now, the thing we can do then is we can chain CAA with CT notifications. I didn't put CT in there because it didn't have three letters. Does anyone know what CT is? All right, certificate transparency. So certificate transparency is a requirement for all certificate authorities to transparently log into CT logs every single certificate that's ever issued. As an example of this, probably the most common one is uh, CRT.SH, which is run by Komodo. You can go to, say, troyhunt.com, like that. Here are all the certificates that have been issued for my site. The reason there's a truckload of them is because troyhunt.com runs through Cloudflare. Cloudflare gives me free certificates. They're subject alternate name certificates. Everyone know what a SAN is? For those who don't, I'm going to show you something disturbing in a moment. 
Uh, what happens with Cloudflare is that they regularly reissue certificates because other subscribers come on, they put other names on the same certificate, yours gets reissued. So we see a lot of instances here of, uh, of my domain. There are... Go on. <laughs> well, I actually, can you maybe do it in the mic because it might be interesting for other people as well. I'll ask that again. So with the SAN, what happens if you get lumped with, say, a, a site that's not as reputable as yourself? It's the same cert, isn't it? So in a case like Cloudflare, they manage the private key for the cert. They manage the cert itself. They manage all the traffic that goes through it. Uh, they have access to all of the traffic for everyone on that cert, but you never have access to anyone else, anyone else's traffic on that same cert. You only get what's going to your website. But that's only because of the way they manage it. Like, you can't go out tomorrow and get someone else's name on there. Where I thought you were going to go is what happens if you end up on a SAN through someone like Cloudflare with someone else and you don't like their name? I, I think that's what I was trying to do. All oh, right. C can you... Being conscious, we're broadcasting. Give me an example of a name that you would not like to end up next to. Triple X videos. I can go much worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> Big. Oh boy. So th there's another MVP uh, who came to me a little while ago and he said, look, I, um, I went out and I got a SAN certificate or I went out and got Cloudflare. I, I did what you said I should have done. Uh, so this is Paul Cunningham. And he went out and put his things behind Cloudflare and he got in touch with me afterwards and he said, look, uh, you know, I followed your advice, went and did this. I looked at the subject alternate names, which is what SAN is, and some of them weren't very nice. And I was thinking what you were thinking. I was like, ah, oh, it's just going to be like triple X videos. And like, who cares too much? Let's have a look at who he was sitting next to here. We'll just, just let you marvel at this for a moment. <laughs> He's the one in the middle. Just, you know, just Now, how do we feel about this? I mean, like amusement value aside. At least they all have the same name. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, actually, that's interesting. They're all XYZs, yeah. No, serious question. How do we feel about it? It doesn't really matter, does it? So you're right, only the geeks look at it. And, and you know, for, for context, if we go back and look at my certificate and we look at the details and we go down to uh, subject alternate names, which is there. Oh, why that one only got me on it? <laughs> no, it wasn't me. Oh, you know, okay, we'll, we'll try another really, try this one. Uh, try something that is pretty basic. Um, there's a story. There's always a story. Uh, oh, story. Yeah. I don't know. You might have seen the talk because I did it in Oslo last year. Actually, I did it in DC in Sydney last year as well. So I did this talk called um, uh, Hack Your Career. And if you haven't seen this talk before, it's, a, a lot of people love it because it's, it's not security stuff. It's very sort of, how did I do a lot of what Adam was just talking about? You know, go from like corporate life to riding jet skis all the time. Uh, and it sort of talks about that transition and, and part of the way through I talk about the abuse I've got and I, I know Adam has seen some of the abuse and we can't repeat what was said <laughs> in the abuse here. <laughs> if you come to beers I'll show you, I've literally got it screen grab. And I was sort of pointing out that as you get more public visibility there's more people that, that just frankly want to be dicks and I was showing some of the abuse and someone actually set up uh, a WordPress site called Troy Hunt Sucks. And they wrote lengthy blog posts about how much I suck. And they, they generally put a lot of effort into it. Uh, and it was just, it was inane shit. So it was like after I got the regional director thing, this guy wrote a big blog post about how much I suck for <laughs> getting the regional director thing. And they created a, um, a discuss account called Troy Hunt Sucks as well so that they could go and comment in other places about how much I suck. Uh, there was love put into it. And I thought, well, what I should do is I should go and get the domain and just clarify for everyone the, the actual, so uh, I use that as part of the, um, as part of the talk. And, and then the funny thing that happened is, um, I don't know, and, and this doesn't happen as much now because of GDPR, but if you registered a domain and you didn't pay for privacy, what normally happens within about five seconds of that? Spam calls, right? 
It's like, hi, we're from India. We'd like to build you a website. <laughs> no. So I started getting all these calls, and the operators were calling me up saying Troy Hunt sucks. And I thought, well, this is hilarious, so I should just start recording all of the operators. So in the talk I do, it, it literally has all of these sort of one after the other, all these call center operators saying Troy Hunt sucks. And all I started doing, I just got to the point where I was like, let's just mess with everyone. How many times can I get them to say Troy Hunt sucks? And they'd say, and I'd say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a long way away. I can't quite hear you properly. <laughs> you know, could you do it again? Anyway, that's in the video. San, uh, subject alternate name, subject alternate Unless, I have a feeling something was changing. Uh, there we go. Oh, no, here we go. Tells us the whole lot. So let's, let's actually make this a little bit easier. We'll, um, da -da -da -da. All right, so these are all the names that I have next to me at the moment. Now, one of the interesting things is, is that Cloudflare does group together names of the same owners of sites. Now, I'm not saying Paul owns the other sites. I'm just saying... <laughs> Just saying, that would explain it because I, I own that one just there. Uh, I own that one just there. I own that one just there. Uh, yeah, like there's a few there that are mine. And, and obviously that one just there. So, oh, and yeah. Well, that was, yeah. So anyway, they group them together. But the, the, the point is, is that, all right, from a security perspective, when it's managed by Cloudflare like this, there's no security vector to this. From an image perspective, yes, if you drill down into the cert and you go down to the sand stuff and you look at it, it can be funny, but honestly, that's it. And if you really, really don't like it, I think it costs about five bucks a month to get your own certificate uh, from Cloudflare. So, you know, there's that. All right, so how did we get there? Ah, we're talking about certificate transparency. So every time a certificate is created, it ends up in the certificate transparency logs. There are certificate transparency log notification services. So, for example, Facebook has one. Like of all the organizations, Facebook has one. And what Facebook uh, allows you to do is say, send me a message every time a new certificate is generated. I have had a lot of messages lately. But, you know, th this is really good because it means that CAA allows you to restrict who can issue a certificate and then CT allows you to see when the certificate is issued and get told about it straight away. So we're getting a heap of transparency. Incidentally, one of the reasons why it's good to see phishing sites get certificates is that we get a really nice log of it. And you can go through CT logs and see lots of things like PayPal phishing domains with a level of transparency that's much harder to get from just like who is records. Okay, any questions about this? All right, let's do one more acronym. And I, I believe I promised everyone a Trump thing. So let's, uh, let's go under there. Let's get rid of all those tabs over there. Now, one of my favorite sites is this one here. Has anyone used this site before? Oh, you are missing out. All right, what you do is you go to this site, and you've got this trumpet, right? And you, you move the trumpet around and see how his eyes follow the trumpet? And then you get it to where you want it to go. <laughs> and you just keep going like round, around, 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 around. And it's hilarious. And it's, it's honestly the best Trump website I've seen to date. True story. Now, <laughs> let's have a look at the source code of the page because there's something kind of interesting going on here. Uh, if we look for Cloudflare, we can see a few different libraries loaded off Cloudflare. Can anyone think of a potential problem with this. I, I, I'll give you a little hint. Well, I, all right, there's a, there's a good direction to go. Why not? Because you can't be sure that that's been provided. You can't be sure that's the intended version of Shakespeare. Okay, so what you're saying here is that I could go, look, I'm, I'm the web dev, right? I go and build this and I put in this reference to jQuery and it all works beautifully, but what happens if that file changes later on? And, and what happens, let's say hypothetically, Cloudflare takes a disliking for Trump for reasons who knows, uh, but they decide to then maliciously modify that file. What can you do by modifying a JavaScript file? Yeah, a, a lot is... I can hear another Trump in the background. <laughs> I think, there's a go Raj's evening. Um, 
the, so the, the correct answer is if you can run arbitrary JavaScript on someone else's website, you can do just about anything. You can do a heap. So the problem here is that if Cloudflare modifies this file, they can cause this website to behave differently. Now, incidentally, I'm doing a very similar thing down here. In fact, I'll zoom in a little bit and we'll, we'll do a search for Cloudflare. So we're on Have I Been Pwned. We'll go down the bottom here. Let's just go to there. Same sort of thing, right? Now, let's do this because we, we want to sort of emulate what would happen if we change this file outside of the website itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to Fiddler. Who's used Fiddler before? <laughs> Just about everyone. Who's used Fiddler script before? Let the record show. That's two and a half people, which is interesting. And uh, every time I do this, because I do this in my workshops, it's always really curious to find that like just about everyone's used Fiddler, but there's this tiny, tiny slice of people that have used Fiddler script. Fiddler script's really cool because what you can do is hook into events such as on before request and on before response. Now, remembering that Fiddler is a proxy, so all your traffic is going through it and then coming back through it again after responding from the server. You can modify anything on the request. Add headers, remove headers, modify the body. Redirect it to another host name. You can modify anything on the response, such as modifying headers and body. Now, I am down here in the on before response event, and I have, I'm going to scroll this over a little bit, there's the narrowest little handle there. All right, I have a Trumpification script. Now, what this Trumpification script is going to do is it's going to add something else into the response body of the JavaScript. Now, to, to be clear here, we're modifying this traffic whilst it's on the fly. This is not really the threat that we're trying to protect against because HTTPS is the thing that protects us from modifying traffic on the fly. What this is allowing us to do is to, to effectively demonstrate the premise that you just made. So what happens if the file changes and it does something different? So I'm going to click the little capturing section down the bottom left. We're going to go back to here. And I was viewing the source before. Let's just go and open this buzz library. That's come from cache. That's the bottom of the file. I'm going to give it a hard refresh because what I want to see is I want to see the request go out through Fiddler, come back, and then actually be modified. And if I scroll down a little bit now, everyone agree we've got Trumpification script? OK, very good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to give the page a hard reload. So what should happen is this entire page will now be loaded through Fiddler. The JavaScript file will come through Fiddler. It will get the Trumpification script in it. And because, as we discussed earlier on, when you can control JavaScript, you can do anything on the page, I'm going to make a very subtle change to what happens on this page. Now, one of the things about having a slow network is it makes it more suspenseful. All right, here we go. I got the crazy little driving trump is now set as the background image of every single div on the page. It still works, too. So you see how I've just modified what's on the page? I could have put on a crypto miner, put on a phishing page, served malware, done basically whatever I wanted to if I could modify that file at Cloudflare. Now, that is also going to change the Have I Been Pwned one. And I'm going to go and open that JavaScript library that I loaded before. And just to make the point, so there's no Trumpification or anything in there. But Fiddler's running. So if I reload it, we can see what happens. It should pull it through Fiddler, come back down to the bottom. We've now got Trumpification on the JavaScript being loaded into Have I Been Pwned. So if I go back to Have I Been Pwned now, and I reload it, am I going to see Crazy Trump in the background of every div? No, because I don't want that. <laughs> Nobody wants that, let's be honest. Now, as it loads, if I jump to the console, we're going to see something new. OK, first of all, the network is slow, so there's that. Secondly, failed to find a valid digest in the integrity attribute for resource, and then we've got the path of the JavaScript with the computed SHA-256 integrity. Now, here's how this works. This is SRI. It's our last acronym of the night. SRI is sub-resource integrity. And sub-resource integrity allows you to take a JavaScript file that you know is good. So let's imagine it was jQuery on that site. Or it wasn't actually. No, you did say jQuery. Mm -hmm. You weren't happy about it. So you take a jQuery that you trust. Because at some point in time, you've got to have one you trust. 
then you take a SHA-256 of that file. And what you do then is you go down to where you embed it. It'll be over here. Da -da -da -da. And you add an integrity attribute. And then you put a SHA-256, or it can be a SHA-384 as well, on the tag. Now, when your browser sees this and it loads that JS file, it will then hash it and compare it. And if they don't match, it won't run it. So this is super cool, right? Because you get to have the benefits of a CDN. And, and to be clear, why do we do this? Because if you load it from Cloudflare CDN, they've got 150-something edge nodes around the world. I was reading just the other day. So their goal is to have, I think it was 99% of the world within 10 milliseconds of an edge node, which is just crazy, right? Like that makes things super, super fast. So that's the reason you want this. Plus, you don't pay for this, right? It's their public CDN. So you don't have to pay to load JavaScript and get somewhere else. But this allows you to get it from there and still be protected as well, which is really awesome. And it's, it's simple, right? This is all it is. Now, if the JavaScript file changes legitimately, they rev the version or something, and it's still on the same path, you're screwed. It breaks. So, so what you're saying here is that if, if I use SRI, the file can't change arbitrarily without me knowing about it. But, but think about that as well, because that's kind of a good thing, right? It's like, well, I would actually like the file not to change arbitrarily without me knowing about it, because that's kind of a worrying concept. Mm. Any questions about SRI? Well, now we're talking about hash collisions. So hash collisions, particularly for, uh, for higher entropy hashes, are enormously difficult. So you would have to figure out how can, well, in fact, you'd have to figure out multiple things. You have to compromise the source file, number one. Okay. Number two, you then have to figure out how to create a hash collision such that I could put my malicious code in that external file, but when it hashes, it still comes down to the same value. And now you're starting to make things very, very hard. No, nah, it just, it just rejects it. In fact, what I've done here, so, so this is kind of neat. Uh, the, the way I've done this is I said, look, let's actually have this, okay, our, our integrity attribute. And then I'm going to have a fallback position. So after this, I've got a script tag. We're running out of time to talk about nonsense, but Google it <laughs> if you're interested. I'm going to try and evaluate window.jQuery. But if my jQuery hasn't loaded, this will be false. If it's false, I'm going to document.write out a reference to a jQuery file on my local machine. So this is a really cool way of saying, try and get it from a CDN. If it doesn't, if it doesn't hash to the same value, then reject it, but go and grab the one locally instead. Easy peasy. What could go wrong? Serious question, what could go wrong? All right, if, so if someone, like if someone hacks your local file and they could change the integrity attribute, Mate, you've got bigger problems. Because <laughs> you know, so, this is what people say. They're like, well, what if I get into the HTML and I change this? So like your day is much, much worse than just like one bad JavaScript file then. Um, so there is no report URI directive for SRI. You can catch the event in JavaScript and implement your own report URI, but there's no spec. So I'll show you one last thing, and, and this is sort of the, the here's the problem, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. I left this guy open for a reason. Oh, repeat the question. What was the question? Oh, so that... Oh, so sorry, the, the, the question was, is there any reporting construct like with CSP? No, there's not. And then I gave the answer. <laughs> uh, so here is the remaining problem with SRI. So what are we going to get if we go back to good old Internet Explorer? There we go. So <laughs> SRI support and upgrade in secure request support basically tracked at parity, which is that uh, Edge 17, which hit three or four months ago, got support for it. No version of Edge before that has support. No version of IE has support. And, and this is kind of one of the interesting things, too. Like, I, I think people kind of lose track. And uh, to, to be honest, pretty much everyone's on Chrome or Firefox these days anyway. But people kind of lose track of there's a lot of really cool native security defenses in the browser. One of the, the things that I find really interesting now is that um, 
I went to a, a, a conference last month in uh, London, and when I went to this conference, it was one of these sort of big exhibition ones, and there's all these security vendors, and they're selling all of this stuff for huge amounts of money. Like, if you want to spend money, go, anyone been to RSA in San Francisco? Oh, holy shit, it's a circus. All of these companies wanting to spend money on all this stuff. And there's these things that are like built into your browser for free, and they work really, really well. And people have never heard about them before. And they stop some of the really major attacks that we've seen in the past as well. So, you know, this is really, really cool stuff. It's available for free. Everyone can go and use it, and it works across pretty much every browser. All right, I'm conscious of the time. Does anyone have questions? Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what do you think of um, uh, arguments that clients use to not use Azure AD or A Azure B2C and just roll your own? <laughs> I, was, I sort of had an answer in mind all the way to got to the bit about just roll your own because you know, one of the, the sort of recurring themes in security is, is wherever possible, don't roll your own stuff. Uh, there's a saying which says anyone can roll their own crypto that they can't break, right? So everyone, everyone wants to have a go at a lot of this stuff. I really want to use stuff that I know has been really seriously, robustly tested and also really well supported. I, um, particularly dealing with the data breaches, I am increasingly of the view that I never want to hold passwords. I really do not want to hold passwords. I love, I love the the mechanical premise of things like social logins. I love the idea of logging in via Google, Twitter, Facebook, etc. I worry about the usability friction, and particularly depending on the demographic. Like I worry about saying, for example, to an elderly audience who may be less inclined to use social media, I worry about saying, hey, you know, I've, I've built this new service, just go and log on with Facebook. Well, there's a whole bunch of other problems there. But I really like the premise of something like Azure AD, where it's like there is a, a service where they will run the whole thing for you. They will store your passwords, they'll handle all the rate limiting, they'll, they'll uh, do 2FA, they'll do the password resets. Like they will wrap everything up for you and then you just plug into that. And if I get absolutely totally owned, at least I'm never going to lose everyone's passwords. So yeah, I, I think it's a really good idea. To, to be honest, I, the, the only sort of use cases that come to mind where people have valid arguments against it, particularly in things like really heavily regulated industries like finance, etc. So I'm not sure if we've got, maybe you know actually, Adam, but I'm not sure if we've got any local banks, for example, that are like, yeah, we'll just put all our customer passwords in Active Directory on Azure. Quickly follow up on that. Oh, have you come across any um, login mechanisms where um, people have de-identified usernames, like a public service where there, where the username is actually de-identified? So it's not an email address, it's not a name. Oh, right. Let's but but you actually get assigned a, a a completely decoupled username from your Id identification. Like logging into your bank with a customer number. Something like that. Yeah. So, uh, I've been a little and bit... And sorry, and how would you integrate that with yeah, yeah. Azure B2C or Azure AD or whatever? I've been a little bit inclined to, to write something on this. And the only reason I hesitate is that I don't want to give away too much about some of the things that I do. But I actually like the premise of, for important accounts, having usernames that other people don't know. And when you think about the amount of havoc people can cause when they know your username, it can be kind of painful. So thinking about things like uh, a lot of people use plus aliasing in email addresses. I don't know if for those of you yep. not, not seen plus aliasing, that would be like I'm you know, john at gmail.com. But what I can do ooh, is I can go back to that tab and I can say instead of john at gmail.com, I'm going to be like john plus uh, Netflix. You know? And I'm going to use that email address on my Netflix account. But if I want to have something that people don't know, well then I might just add some random crap in the end of it. And, and this gives a surprisingly good amount of obfuscation. Yep. So at least then it's like, hey, someone wants to go and try and hammer away your Netflix account or do password resets or try and prove their identity if they call up your bank or something. Well, you've got to know the email address. That's something. I was going to go back to the Azure AD question. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah? Yep. Uh, would you have a quick uh, answer to how to migrate your own passwords into Azure AD? <laughs> Normally the question is, 
and I'll, I'll explain this, and it, it may partially explain the Azure AD thing. Normally, it'll be something like I'll, I'll do a workshop, and someone will say, "Look, um, ashamed to admit it, we got MD5 hashes of passwords, and we would like to roll over to Bcrypt. But how do we do it? Because we can't unhash MD5, right?" We could go through and crack it, and then I'm like, "Do you really want to be the guy who's like cracking all your customer passwords?" <laughs> you know, like I, I probably wouldn't state that publicly. How are you going to do it? Well, what you can do is you can take that hash and you can rehash it. So I can take all my MD5s and I can bcrypt them. Now I've got a hash inside a hash, and it feels a little bit dirty, but you abstract that away into a method somewhere and you just forget about it, and that's that's your new normal. I'm not sure if you could do that with Azure AD. I'm not sure if there's an API somewhere where you can say, "I would like to automatically create accounts and set the password." And the password is going to be this 32-byte MD5 hash, which I'm going to pass in. And then I have to make sure when people authenticate, I then put that little wrapper around it, which MD5 is at first. Th that'll be the first thing that would come to mind. What I I'll tell you what you wouldn't want to do. You wouldn't want to send everyone an email and say, hey, by the way, could you create a new password? Not a good look. <laughs> people sort of then, they, uh, they then go to Twitter and they go, hey, there's been a new data breach, CC Troy Hunt. And that's it. And do you have any opinions on uh, services like Auth0, Auth um, maybe versus Identity Server? Look, I think anything that allows you to start abstracting away the bits that you're responsible for is, is usually a good idea. And something like Auth0 is very prominent and well known. If it was something less mainstream that popped up tomorrow and I've never seen before, I'd be a bit more worried about it. I don't, look, at least something like Identity Server is a very well-known quantity and you, you probably run that on-prem and manage the whole thing yourself anyway. But I, I do like the idea of not having to do it yourself. Like I, I think back to the, the times, you know, when I was back at Pfizer and the number of times we'd get an app built for us from some cheapest possible low-cost shop, not here, incidentally. <laughs> um, and you'd, you'd get this thing and they have completely custom built all their password storage, all their authentication, all their session persistence, even their session identifiers. And you're going, why didn't you use like the membership provider in Visual Studio 2012? And they'll go, what's that? <laughs> so, <laughs> we've got a lot of this built in already. Like, why do you have to rebuild this stuff? So yeah, you use what is known, trusted, and proven wherever possible. Um, when you implement something like B2C in your you know, your lay in the Owen layer and that sort of stuff. It's a bit of an odd question, but where do you go to ensure that you've actually implemented it correctly? So you can follow the step by step. Yeah. But your security is something you're gonna do for a few days, then hopefully if you've done it right never touch it again. <laughs> um how do you validate the processes and approaches? I mean I'm not talking about pen testing or stuff like that. I'm talking about a more fundamental basis. I think the things that sort of stand out to me there is the premise that it's something that you do for a few days or that you get right and then you don't touch it because I really think that's that's the wrong way of looking at it. Um, we've been doing this this series on Pluralsight called uh, Creating a Security Centric Culture. So uh, this is actually pretty cool because what we've been doing here, uh, Security Centric Culture, Google works all this out. It's like as it gets later, the spelling just totally goes down here. <laughs> and it still works it out. There you go. So Pluralsight's got this free series that we're doing. We're doing a, a quarterly video about trying to change the, the cultural approach to security. And, and the reason we're doing this is I was over in the States in September doing a talk and meeting a bunch of Pluralsight customers. And, and every single one of them, the, the one common question that they all said, or, or all asked rather, is they said, you know, there's, there's a lot of material out there, for example, if you want to learn about what SQL injection is. If you don't want to have SQL injection, there's lots of material you can go and learn, the, like the fundamental hardcore skills. But we want to go beyond that, and we want to actually get the organization thinking about it at, at a sort of more ingrained, natural part of everything they do. And, and the word they kept using was culture. So how do we change the culture so that this is always uh, a, a, a key sort of tenant of our development? And I, I think that's... That's where we've got to be. The, the thing that really worries me is when an organization says, uh, let's add security now. And, and this is what used to happen at Pfizer and, and to, in their defense, it's very much like many other organizations as well. So, so the way to work there is we would offshore it. So it would go to, uh, to India, Philippines or China. They would build the whole thing. 
they'd chuck it back over the fence at the end and then Pfizer would say, oh, we better make sure it's secure now. Like at the end of the project, when you're out of time and you're out of money, let's make sure it's okay. And guess what normally happened, <laughs> right? Like we would, I would literally get pages that could be hundreds of documents long that had come out of HP Web Inspect or Fortify On Demand or some other automated security scanner, which anyone could have run. And now you've got this big laundry list of stuff you've got to fix because they'd never thought about it beforehand. They're adding it on at the end. And when you get that at the end of the project, there's no more time, there's no more money. And what happens is, is you go down, you do the most important stuff because they're all ranked by criticality. It's like severe, critical, high, medium, low. And you go down until you run out of time and money completely. And then the marketing manager signs off on all the XSS and all the missing CSRF and the other acronyms I can barely spell. And that's just the fundamentally wrong way to do it. I do think things like penetration tests are really valuable. I think things like bug bounties are really valuable. But I want them finding really good stuff. You know, like I don't want them finding stupid things like you, you're missing HTTP only attributes on cookies or something that people should have just got right in the first place. I don't know if that completely answered your question or not, but I, th I think it is something which, which pervades across it and you don't just add it on. I certainly agree about the cultural concept, but when you're talking about stuff that's technically quite complicated, so not so much uh, in embedding a culture of approaching security at the right time, but some of these things are quite sophisticated and there is a reasonable element of black box about how they operate and the manner in which they operate and just follow this or fill this in as part of the process, unfortunately. So I guess it's where do you step up apart from the end of line testing, which I would agree you don't want to leave until the end of the line. What other measures can you take or who can you um, work with to make sure that your implementation is following the path of the true without becoming an expert? I, or is that the, your only choice? I, look, I, I think that it's a bit of an abstract question, but the, the things again that come to mind, uh, yeah, if, if we're talking about things that are technically complex, that is something that you want to plan well in advance. You know, you certainly don't want to be doing it at the end. So if it was me and I was, let's say I was having to design something which integrated with the hardware security module and stored cryptographic keys. And we had, like, you got to get that stuff right. Uh, that's the sort of thing that you want to plan well in advance. I mean, this, this is like a design time architecture decision, right? Like, let's figure out how we're going to get that right then. I would want to have a, a, a process where this sort of stuff is validated along the way as well. The last thing I'd want to do is get to the end and then bring in the pen testers or the likes. But you know, none of these things tend to work in a black box either. Like, they, they've all got some form of external dependency or API or integration. Uh, and that's where I think the culture thing comes into play. Like, how do we make sure that everything else it touches doesn't just become the weak point in the chain. So I, I, I think it's, it's really hard to sort of give you one discrete answer and go, just parameterize all your queries and then we'll be fine. But they're the things that come to mind. Any more guys? I'll ask. Um, have I been pawned? I assume you're crazy proud of it. Can, um, can I just say that every time you say that, I think of have I been P-O-R-N-E-D, <laughs> which, which alarmingly does autocomplete in my browser. And of course I did buy that because people just, I don't know, people just like saying porn sometimes. <laughs> okay. Have I been pwned? Uh, what, <laughs> which I believe you would be very proud of. It's uh, users from everywhere in the world all the time. Uh, what's the coolest event that's happened s since building this? I think the, the, the thing that immediately came to mind is what you mentioned earlier on, which was the, the congressional testimony thing. Um, so I, for those of you that, that didn't see it, I went to um, Washington DC in, in November because they, they had this committee uh, that was investigating the impact of data breach on knowledge-based authentication. So you know how when, let's say it's Telstra, right? You call up Telstra and you go, oh, I'd like to reroute all my SMS messages to another number. And they go, yeah, yeah, no worries. Let's just make sure you are who you say you are. What's your date of birth? That's knowledge-based authentication. It's static knowledge-based authentication because you can never change it. You don't just get a new dog and give it a different name. It's like you are stuck with this for life. And uh, the, the Congress over there, like, they were basically getting concerned that uh, knowledge-based authentication was becoming much less effective because we have so much data leaked everywhere. You know, I mean, I, I mentioned this data breach that will go live probably in less than 12 hours now with, with a nine-figure number of, of uh, records. I'll talk more about that incident tomorrow. Suffice to say that for each person in there, they had hundreds of personal attributes exposed. Hundreds. 
just about everything you could imagine. It's, it's just insane. And th th this is something that, that has been covered in the press before. Um, and when that data is out there, your ability to prove your identity based on information that is known just goes out the door. So I found it really interesting to go there and, and sit in Congress, and you've probably all seen like Congress on videos and movies and stuff. Like it's a pretty formal environment. I got dressed up, which is very unusual. I got dressed up today, which is very unusual for me. So I, I literally had to go out and buy a suit <laughs> and a tie, because basically I just wear board shorts. Um, so that was a really big thing. And then I got to sit there in, in front of like lawmakers on the other side of the world and say, pwned a lot. Oh, you're making me do it now as well. Pwned a lot. <laughs> And I, like, I never saw that coming. Like, that, was, that was a really interesting experience. And um, they were really cool too. Like the, the folks there at Congress, they were all really lovely, just really interesting people. They had, um, you know, congressmen and congresswomen were obviously very important people, but they were very ingratiating and very happy that I'd gone over there. And that the folks behind them, the staffers, who actually prepare all the questions and have to figure out what to do, they were really technically smart too. So I was, um, yeah, I, that was just something I never saw coming. Like if you had told me that, even a year ago, let alone you know, four and a half years ago when I started this, I just would have been like, nah, you know, can't see that happening. Uh, what about the uh, integration with Firefox? How do you feel about that? Yeah, so the Firefox one's cool. Um, it, it's interesting. So almost a year ago, we started working on integrating uh, just the free API that lists breaches. So what I mean by that is when we go to the API here, there is a, a section which gets all breach sites in the system and you go here and then here's a get request and it will just come back and it will show you a JSON response of all the breaches. And that's it, you know, it's basically just an index or a directory. And they wanted to integrate that into Firefox so that they could show you if a site had been breached before. And at the time we sort of started throwing around this idea of, um, you know, building in searches for email addresses too. And we didn't discuss it much more. But then this particular piece went live in Firefox and it just got massive press. Like it was crazy. I remember I was actually in, uh, yeah, I was in Rockhampton at the time. I was doing a workshop. And there's like journos from all over the world calling up going, oh, this is amazing. Like have I been pwns in Firefox? And I'm going, it's just a JSON list. Like why are you so excited? But it got really, really positive press. I, I think because there's a lot of love for Mozilla being, you know, open source and you know, all the rest of it. Uh, so then, uh, earlier this year, we sort of started to talk more about well, how do we do the email thing. And I was actually in San Fran, uh, I think it was about March, and we were sort of talking about ways it could work. And they were really, really emphatic about protecting the identity of their users, so they never wanted to send me an email address, for example. And I was quite emphatic about not just picking up the entire database and giving it even to Mozilla. <laughs> so we had to kind of find like what's the right middle ground for this. And we ended up doing the same K anonymity thing as what I just showed you with Pwn passwords, except rather than 517 million passwords, it's now almost uh, 5.4 billion email addresses and we take the first six characters of SHA-1 hash. Um, so they integrated in, into that and I built out a whole uh, Azure Functions endpoint to, to service that too. And uh, yeah, they're in a, a, a testing phase at the moment. Seems to be going well. I'm not hearing anything bad, <laughs> which is nice. And if that goes well, probably later this year they'll roll it out into Firefox proper and then everyone with Firefox will be able to go and hit a Have I Been Pwned endpoint and do a search. So kind of interesting to see what my Azure traffic does <laughs> when I get to that. And uh, on a half related note, um, you've been giving a lot of love to Azure and a lot of explanations. To who, sorry? To, to Azure. That's how they say it. And uh, I would love it if uh, maybe one day you could publish how much more traffic is going to Azure and maybe what your Azure bill is looking like, because it must be crazy. You know, I, I did recently, and it's, um, I'm just being conscious it's being recorded and publicly screencast, otherwise I'd show you more. You're like, you, you just never know, <laughs> you know, when you load up a site. But what I can do is safely load up my Twitter, because I published a bunch of figures on Pwn passwords, and um, actually, out of curiosity, whilst we're waiting for the incident to catch up, has anyone here used Azure Functions before? All right, well, that's a good whack of the audience. So yeah, Functions are awesome for all the reasons that you guys probably know. Uh, and if I look for uh, Functions, 
function. Oh, you know what? They've what's the Azure account? Is Azure functions like that? Functions, it'll be in there somewhere. So I'm really using a, a combination of uh, Azure Functions and Cloudflare quite extensively. And what's making that really cool? You know what? It'll be in my pictures. Oh, yeah. Did you see it? <coughs> ah. There it is. Oh, go. Got it. So I'm using a combination of, uh, of Cloudflare and Azure Functions. And uh, there's a, a little bit of a... Ooh, is that it? I missed it, didn't I? Oh, man. Let's go back. There we go. The best way to make Azure go fast is not to hit Azure. Like, this is the most insightful thing you'll hear or not. And that is not a negative thing about Azure in any way, shape, or form. But that is, so just a little bit of background for everyone, uh, Cloudflare. Who's used Cloudflare before? All right, less people. You want to use Cloudflare. Trust me, it is totally epic for this sort of stuff. What Cloudflare does, they're a globally distributed CDN, they're a reverse proxy. You set your domain up to use their name servers, and then everyone around the world, when they go to your domain, they actually hit one of Cloudflare's, it was 151 edge nodes last week, maybe more now, we'll see in a moment. You hit one of their edge nodes, which is still 151, and then they either reply from cache, or they let the traffic go through. They can do other stuff like block malicious traffic and all that sort of stuff. But uh, they can cache stuff around the world. Now, if the traffic goes through, you're hitting an edge node close to you. So they've got one in Sydney. So we might go from here to like the CBD or something. And then if it has to go to the origin, then it goes off to West US Data Center. So every little one of those dots is, is an is a, uh, exit node for Cloudflare or an edge node for Cloudflare. Now, what I, was, what I end up doing with Pwn passwords is because, and there's a little bit of math here, because you're searching for the first five characters of a SHA-1 hash, you have five characters with 16 different possible values in each because it's all going to be hexadecimal. So you've got 16 to the power of five different possible searches that you can do, which is just over a million. Now, what that means is that I've only got like a million and a little bit different possible requests that can happen. So they get really aggressively cached in every one of those purple dots around the world. About 94% of the requests that come through to Pwn passwords, Cloudflare just returns. So I only pay for 6% of the requests that hit Azure. Then, as many of you already know, when you use an Azure function, if you're using the consumption model, you pay on, on two metrics. So you pay on the amount of memory used over a period of time. They measure it in gigabit seconds. And you pay for executions. I did these stats the other day, and we'll just look at the graph because that probably explains things the best. And I wanted to sort of illustrate how ridiculously cheap it is to stand up a service like this. So function execution units. So I measured my function execution units. Now, actually, let's t just for context, this is, uh, this is 54 million searches a week. It's quite a bit more than that now, but that's a good number to begin with. 54 million searches a week was using this many megabit seconds, which is this many gigabit seconds. Uh, that's how many per month. They actually give you this many for free per month. So after I published these figures, a bunch of people were like, ah, oh, you just get free stuff because you work for Microsoft. No, I don't work for Microsoft. And secondly, everyone gets the same free grant. So based on the amount of execution units, that's what I pay for that bit. I'm happy with that number. Now, you also pay for execution counts. Now, I was paying for about 4 million execution counts over the period of the week. The reason it's only 4 million and not 54 million is because Cloudflare is serving most of those responses directly from their edge nodes anyway. Now, it's that many per month, but you get this many per month for free. Uh, this is how many billable units. That's how much I was paying for execution units. Now, this is, this is for the week. So I was paying... No, actually, that was for the entire month. I was paying $3.35 a month total to do 54 million queries. I think that, was it over the period of the month? No, it would have been over, per week. I've got to go back and check the figures. But it was just like a ridiculous amount. And then frankly, where the money was, it came down to here. The money came down to the bandwidth. This is the big bucks here, this guy, right? So <laughs> my big bucks is I was paying, that, that is actually for the month, because I, I know that it, it all ended up to be about a dollar a day. So I'm paying uh, 20 bucks a month for the egress bandwidth between Azure and Cloudflare. It's it's free. So, all right, good question. Um, this one here, they give to me uh, because 
I'm very nice to them. <laughs> uh, no, actually, the, the reason why they did it is Cloudflare originally designed the K-anonymity model for Pwn passwords. They also uh, offered to provide a service where they really aggressively cache the downloadable content. So the downloadable content, you know how I said you could download those 517 million uh, hashes? I put all them in blob storage. Does anyone know what it would cost to support the amount of content that Cloudflare downloads or people download from uh, Azure? I tell you what, let's do the mess. What could go wrong? I'm sure I can go and look at this account. Uh, and while that's loading, we'll get up the we'll get up the uh, Azure uh, calculator. Calculator, calc, you later. It's beer o'clock. All right, so we're going to get these these two things here. So what I want to do is, is look at the amount of egress bandwidth that Cloudflare has sent, and then we'll put that into the calculator and we'll work out how much it costs. And then we'll talk about the kinds of discussion that I would need to have with my wife when I get home. Uh, Pwn passwords is there. Now, the, the really bulky stuff with Pwn passwords is downloading the zip files of passwords. So if I look at my analytics for uh, the last month, and I go to my bandwidth. Uh, okay, so 13.22 terabytes. What does 13.22 terabytes cost off the top of your head in Azure or egress data? Uh, where's data? Data. Is it data or do they call it downloads? Ah, oh, bookmark. Functions. No, get rid of that. Bandwidth. West US, what do we say it was? Uh, no, sorry, it was 50 terabytes for the month. Can you imagine if I, I had to go home and say, <laughs> funny thing happened the other day, darling. I'm always worried about having this discussion because it's really easy to spin stuff up and then forget you spun it up. Yeah, but <laughs> you've done that. But here's the thing. So because Cloudflare so aggressively cached it, incidentally, the dark blue is what's been cached. The light blue is what hasn't been cached. Everyone see the light blue? No, of course not. The uncached bandwidth was 482 gigabytes. So what I did end up paying, why don't I go down there? Gigabytes, 482. All right, so it cost me 40 bucks. I'm okay with that. 40 bucks is all right. Um, now, I pay for that one, but let me show you. This is a cool one. Uh, why no HTTPS, which is the one that I set up just, it only went live just over 24 hours ago. So you'll see the graph is going to look kind of screwy, actually, if we look at the last month. So let's look at, um, let's look at the last 24 hours, because that's when it's sort of been big. Now, this is when it loads, because that looks like a month now. This is the totally free service. All right, we'll just work on that month graph. Um, 8.3 million requests. Oh, there we go. So this is in the last 24 hours. 8 million requests, 7.9 million of them have been cached. If you want to see that in percentage numbers, it's that percent. <laughs> Maybe may a rounding error, just saying. Uh, that's the percentage of bandwidth that saved me. This is the free plan. You can set this up in five minutes and wrap it around your website. That makes a hell of a difference to me because the underlying Azure app service this is this, that this sits on has only had to serve 27,000 requests in order for me to serve 8 million requests that actually came to the host name. That's totally cool. That's for free. Everyone goes and gets that if they want it. And I have the luxury of having a site that's largely static and I've got a, a aggressive cache settings on, the, uh, on all the content that's loaded. But yeah, you can, you can do that totally for free. So. You can, you can do whatever you want with the cache. So it will adhere to the cache header that's actually returned on the response. So if we go and have a look at this one down here, uh, network tab, I probably, incidentally, see my waterfall chart and how it doesn't look like a waterfall? No. Everyone know why this happens? So, so all of this is H2. So this is not HTTP 1.1, this is HTTP 2. And HTTP 2 can give you a binary stream of content, which means that rather than like open a connection, maybe make a few requests, do a very, very small degree of async, we can have this binary stream. So all of these flags down here, they all come down at the same time. It's a beautiful graph. 
Uh, I missed the first request, so I'm going to reload that. We'll go back up to the top. There, if we look at my response headers, so first of all, cache hit. All right, CF cache hit means it's been returned from Cloudflare cache. It's not a cache miss. This is the max age. I think this is running at about four days worth of seconds or something like that. I can't remember exact, exactly what I said on it, or two days, something like that. It, it, like it's long enough that if I need to, like if I, I've got to refresh this data shortly. When I refresh it, I will jump into here. I will go over to my cache, which is there. And then I'll just go purge everything. And then 30 seconds later, I'll get a sudden rush of requests that go to the Origin website. It'll return them, and then it'll just all go back to normal. It's pretty neat. Are there any more questions on that front? All right, Troy. Can I ask you a question, which is different? <laughs> um, well, well, I think we're going to make this the last one, because yeah, they're going to close the oaks, and we won't get there. Oh, that would be terrible. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, that's important. Uh, what you were saying about authentication, uh, when I'm in the office tomorrow and they talk to me about customers ringing in and asking, well, how do we authenticate them if I'm told that's bad? And I agree it is bad and I don't have a good answer for it. What's your good answer for it? Wh which is the bad bit? Uh, th well, I know the name of your cat, your dog, and yeah. your mother's maiden name and all of that, that knowledge-based authentication. So how do I do that in a good way? Uh, and mm. secondarily, if I'm actually, uh, you, you get the customer service rep phoning me directly, and how do I know that came from uh, the organisation? So I'll give you two separate shortish answers. So the first bit is you've got to remember all this knowledge-based authentication, we've been doing this for decades, right? So it came from an era, like when I showed MIT towards the start of the, the talk, it came from a much more innocent era, and then it just persisted. <laughs> we have a lot of technology now that we didn't have then. We've got these. Everyone can get an SMS. We've got soft tokens on these. We have got email. We have got hard tokens. We have got all other different ways of verifying identity. We've got RFID on all of these. We've got facial recognition and biometric. Like We've got all of these different other ways, different channels of authentication now we didn't have before. So this is sort of the first part of the question, and, and it's probably going to be an augmentation, but certainly static knowledge-based authentication, bad. The other part of your question then was how do you verify the financial institute? I'll give you a, a true story here. This is a good anecdote to then go and have beer on. Uh, I got some calls from, uh, allegedly from St. George a few years ago, and um, they, uh, sort of a bank called up, and it was, they, bank, air quotes, Long distance call, big pause, sounded like a VoIP, foreign accent. Uh, Hi, we're from St. George. We just need to verify your identity before we proceed. And I'm like, nah, sure you are. I want to verify your identity. And they're like, well, but we're the bank. And I'm like, well, I know you say you're the bank, but I can't be sure. Why don't I call you back on the number on the bank's website? No, 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 that's a different part of the bank. You're a scammer, piss off, and I hung up the phone. And then the next day, they did the same thing again. And I was like, these guys are really persistent. And we had the same discussion. And then they did it on like a Saturday morning. And I like, this is ridiculous. I got in touch with St. George. I had an account there that was overdrawn. And it was a legitimate call. And I complained about it. And I said, look, I want to lodge a complaint about it. This is bullshit because you've just demonstrated every single like scam-like attribute. I'm unhappy about this. So they actually took a percentage uh, off my home loan as, a, as compensation. True story. Don't bank with them anymore. <laughs> now, con conversely... I had a call from Amex and they said, uh, yeah, we're from Amex, there's been fraudulent activity on your account, we just need to verify who you are. And we played the same game again. And I said, well, I want to verify who you are. And they said, sure, take out your card, turn it over, call us back on the number on the back. Job done. You know, like the, the, the difference was like these guys had been trained to do this properly. And obviously St. George had just never thought maybe this might be an issue. So our customers are old and tired and you know, if we just give them an ID card with a phone number on the back of it, it's a great solution. Yeah, I mean, you, you're probably not going to give them like a YubiKey or a biometric cyborg implant in their hand. Yeah. So, you know, like stuff like that, everyone gets. Cool. All right. So thank you very much, Troy. Uh, give everyone, uh, give Troy a round Thanks, of Matt. applause. Thanks, Thank you very much. All right. 
So an awesome night. We learned a lot of stuff. He took us through the history and the whole nine yards. Uh, two and a half hours. It's uh, pre pretty kind of you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to head over to the Oaks. If you want to have a, a beer, that would be awesome. And uh, uh, and you can ask Troy some more questions. Thank <laughs> you.